Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, former Republican operative, maybe future one, Stuart Stevens. It was all a lie how the Republican Party became Donald Trump. And while the CDC issues a federal four-month eviction deferral over COVID health concerns, Massachusetts primary results, Maki wins, Moss loses, and it very well may be the case that everybody blew it in Kennedy's old seat. Joni Ernst floats the idea that Iowa doctors are getting paid to make up COVID statistics. Hmm. Senate uh, Republicans fear a loss of the Senate and will bring up an aspiring fig leaf bill to the Senate floor. State polls show a tightening race and a drop in BLM support. The Postal Service Inspector General finds that the mail has, in fact, indeed, been slowed down. And... We're number one, so the U.S. won't join the world in helping with vaccine development and distribution because, come on. And the number of an unemployed struggling to cover basic costs have doubled in just the few weeks that the extra unemployment payments have expired. All this and more on today's program. Uh, welcome to the show, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us. Um, it is uh, Wednesday, uh, hump day, as uh, we used to call it uh, back in the day, because you were in the middle of the week. I don't know. Uh, time just sort of feels like it's just uh, floating around. Um, and uh, we're just uh, stuck in this uh, weird uh, world of uh of coronavirus there were some interesting statistics out of indiana indiana schools um they have like a nine percent positive rate kids have been back in school now for a couple of weeks uh numbers still not too bad uh coming out of the schools broadly speaking numbers have not gone up in the state very hard to figure out what the deal is um we mentioned yesterday that uh, new york city uh, we'll be reopening a week or two later than originally had planned. Bill de Blasio doing his best to sort of make everybody uh, frustrated uh, one way or another. There's no reason they couldn't have done this three or four weeks ago and helped everybody in the process. But looking forward seems to be uh, problematic for uh, some folks. And of course, it is hindered by the fact that we have no national response. It's a complete disaster on that level. But let's turn to some mixed news. In the Massachusetts primary, um, there are three really, uh, I want to say primary races, but there, I think it was more, but there were three key races here. One was Ed Markey being challenged by Joe Kennedy. Joe Kennedy, a sitting congressman in the fourth district of Massachusetts. Um, there, there, I, I, you know, some people contend that there's just a branding difference between the two of them. I don't think that's quite the, the case. Nevertheless, Markey has been very aggressive uh, with 
climate change, particularly the Green New Deal, other initiatives. Um, what was also rather stunning about this, and I'm in favor of, um, of primaries. I mean, just broadly speaking, generically, I think there should always be primaries. Good. What was interesting was to watch the Democratic leadership, who you will recall, maintain that there is a blacklist against any uh, political firm that would help challengers of incumbents. Now, I guess maybe technically uh, the Democratic leadership was saying this uh, in the House just about House challenges, not Senate challenges. But nevertheless, it, um, it makes it very hard to take them seriously uh, that there is some type of, I don't know, principle in operation here uh, other than an ideological one. Uh, Joe Kennedy lost. He did win Worcester. I don't know how that happened, but um, he did. He lost the rest of the state. Alex Morris lost pretty handily to Richie Neal uh, in Massachusetts first district. This was again, another justice Democrat um, uh, attempt to challenge a, um, one of the highest ranking members of the democratic leadership the chairman of the House and uh, Ways and Means uh, um, uh, Committee, and a guy who really behind the scenes has a decent voting record, but behind the scenes um, sabotaged much of the progressive agenda in terms of like drug pricing, uh, in terms of like the attempt to get Trump's tax returns. I mentioned this quite a bit yesterday. Um, Medicare for all fighting against. Remember, they had that hearing and they weren't allowed to use the words Medicare for all. That was Richie Neal who pushed that. But uh, it was not enough. Local voters in Massachusetts, their concerns aren't maybe as national. And then in the fourth district filling in for Kennedy's seat, uh, it looks like Jake Auchincloss, and we don't know yet, a former Republican is going to win that seat. There were multiple progressives running in that. Uh, the closest one was Jesse Mermel. And unfortunately, uh, we don't know, uh, you know, it, it, it appears that the progressives split the vote. So, you know, down the road, progressives got to get a little smarter. At one point, look at the polls. It happened with uh, Mondaire Jones and he won in New York. At one point, you got to look at the polls and say, where is the biggest opportunity for progressives? Even if it's not the progressive we want. Or not. And we now have a former Republican who's going to end up being, if he pulls it out, which it looks like he's going to, is going to be the one of the most conservative members of the entire caucus, uh, Democratic caucus. We may not need his vote. There may be another crack at him next time, uh, but we shall see. Um, here is Ed Markey. Like we say, uh, one uh, fairly well, uh, easily in uh, Massachusetts, uh, beating Joe Kennedy, the first Kennedy who's lost in Massachusetts, maybe ever. Here is uh, Ed Markey. In this race, justice was on the ballot. Healthcare justice, that's Medicare for all and universal healthcare. <laughs> Educational justice, so that every student has access to first class schools and well paid teachers. Economic justice, so that three billionaires don't hold more wealth than the bottom 50 percentile of our population combined. That's an economic system that's gone off the rails. Racial justice, racial justice, so that we confront our history, make reparations, and root out the systemic racism that keeps us from achieving the promise of liberty and justice for everyone. Today and every day, we say black lives matter, black voices matter. And environmental justice, that's the Green New Deal. Liberty, liberty. 
Uh, so there's Ed Markey. Here's an example from the debate on, on, on one of the reasons why I think uh, Joe Kennedy uh, lost. I don't know how much of it was ideological. I mean, to a certain extent, there is um, there is a in some quarters, it is impossible for a Kennedy to lose in Massachusetts. Um, here, though, I think it's why Kennedy um, couldn't win. One, in part, because Markey is a good senator. Here is, uh, here is uh, Joe Kennedy. Uh, you know, this is where you would expect the Kennedy to shine a little bit, frankly. But go ahead. <laughs> Congressman, what's your worst personality trait or uh, what does your wife think is your worst trait? <laughs> <laughs> Those are going to be two very different things. Um, <laughs> look, I think uh, the um, uh, this is more information than you need. Um, my wife um, does not like it when I um, does not like any, being anywhere near my feet. So feet on the couch is like the big thing that drives her nuts. <laughs> How about you, Senator Markey? What's your uh, wife think is your worst habit or what do you think is your worst trait? My wife cannot believe how obsessed I am with the Red Sox, the Patriots, the Bruins, and the Celtics. She thinks it's a pathology. I tell her that we're genetically hardwired in Massachusetts. You're born a Democrat uh, and a Red Sox fan, then you're baptized seven days later. Uh, that is low, what we call in Massachusetts, low hanging fruit, very low hanging <laughs> fruit. I love the Red Sox too much. What's my, what's my, what's my, what's my biggest weakness? Um, what, my, my, my biggest weakness is probably that I work too hard. That's what it would be. You know, like that's, it's one of those deals. That is a, uh, like the classic, uh, interview technique and yeah. one would imagine he, he would have had that ready but there you go feet yeah. are not a personality trait uh, yeah that's I, true. Think, I think kennedy was trying to be too clever by half going Indeed. for the, the foot fetish vote in massachusetts i don't know what not was going on there. there to be honest with you that but um I, I i pick up my i put my feet on the couch what um folks uh one of today's sponsors is better help who's given our audience 10 percent off their first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report BetterHelp gives you access to your own fully licensed and accredited therapist via phone, chat, or video. Lots of therapists elsewhere have long wait lists. Uh, it can take months, weeks before they see you. When you sign up with BetterHelp, what they do is they match you with a therapist based on your specific needs, fill out a little bit of a survey, not very long. You'll be communicating with them in less than 24 hours. Look, um, Obviously, a lot of people not feeling comfortable going inside uh, to talk to a therapist in this instance, you know, during coronavirus. Also, a tremendous amount of stress during this period. Not only is it stressful because of the added stresses of like, what are we going to do with the kids if you have kids? Or uh, this sucks. I can't go out and uh, party on a regular basis without feeling like I'm risking, uh, you know, my parents' lives or whatever it is. Um, bottom line, this is a great way to uh, find a therapist if you've never been to a therapist is a great way to start and once better help connects you with a therapist if you don't think it's a good fit you can switch to a new one at any time for any reason no additional charge whatsoever they have thousands of licensed therapists they're all over the country they have therapists with specialties that may not be available in your area or might be hard for you to find BetterHelp also tends to be more affordable than therapists you'd find through traditional means you don't have to have insurance to use better help and they have financial aid options for those who qualify. BetterHelp is giving everyone in our audience 10% off your first month. When you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash majority report. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to have uh, Stuart Stevens on uh, Zoom, I believe it's going to be, uh, talking about his book, it was all a lie how the Republican Party became Donald Trump. Right back after this.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the Zoom, I believe. Do we have him? Hey, guys. We do. Stuart Stevens, a author of It Was All Lie, How the Republican Party Became Donald Trump. Stuart, uh, welcome to the program. Well, great to be here, man. I should also say uh, you're a, I don't know, former uh, Republican strategist. Do you consider yourself a former Republican strategist or a um, I, 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 taking I, I, a... I consider a, myself former. Former? Okay. I, t- I turned in my union card. You turned in your union? What is there really a union for Republican? I didn't think so. Um, so, all right, let's start with this. Uh, because I got to tell you, like, you know, I, I think you, you've probably had a lot of interviews where, where people have been a little bit skeptical about, you know, um, the never Trumpers and, um, and uh, to a certain extent, the Lincoln Project. So why, why did you write the book? Uh, great question. I, uh, it goes back to 2016. You know, a lot of people were wrong about Donald Trump, but it's really hard to find somebody who was more wrong than me. Um, I didn't think he'd win the primary. I didn't think he'd win the general. And in retrospect, it was because I didn't want to admit to myself what that meant about the Republican Party. Um, and then I went through a period after he won, kind of like a lot of my friends saying, well, you know, this isn't really the Republican Party. He hijacked it. But I really don't know how to sustain that. I mean, he's head of the Republican Party. The Republican Party is the party that endorsed Roy Moore and attacked John Bolton. So I started asking myself, how did this happen? Um, and it really began in, in that pursuit. I mean, I kind of believe what our high school English teachers taught us, that if you can't write it, you don't understand it. So um, it really began as a very personal pursuit. I, I didn't intend to write it as a book at first, um, but then I ended up writing a book, it, it really to help me try to understand it. What, what was, in the course of writing the book, what was like the, um, the main, what was the, the, the primary realization that you came upon? And, 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 and what were the sort of, I guess, the emotional, intellectual building blocks that made you uh, come to that conclusion? Well, I was fascinated by the whole history of this tension uh, in the Republican Party that dates from World War II. I mean, it really goes back to the Eisenhower wing, which is kind of a sane, governing, boring wing, and the Joe McCarthy wing, which was insane. Um, You know, if Fox News had been around, Joe McCarthy was there, he would have been their darling. He would have had his own show. Um, And how that played out. And I I always thought that our side of the party, call it, you know, that, that side that was a governing side that was a sane side, was the dominant gene. I worked in a lot of campaigns. I went down to Austin in April of 99 to work for George Bush. And, you know, at that time, you could look at conservatism and say a lot of it was sort of a victim of its own success. Um, Cold War was over. I guess we'd won. Um, Welfare was a big issue with conservatives and Bill Clinton instituted welfare reform. Um, There was a whole uh, crime was going down. Uh, Taxes were certainly down from 70 percent that they once were. So I think Governor Bush and others looked at sort of what is a new construct of conservatism and that out of that came compassionate conservatism, that idea. And, you know, if you remember at the time, Bush got a lot of criticism from a lot of conservatives saying, are you saying by calling it compassionate conservatism that conservatism hasn't been compassionate? And Bush's answer to that pretty much was, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, And for him, the access to that was education. If you look at No Child Left Behind, you know, signed with Ted Kennedy over his right shoulder. Um, but then that's probably died on 9-11 when he became a wartime president. So wait, so I, I, I want to circle back to that because I'm curious sure. as to why, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I buy the premise, frankly, but if I did, <laughs> okay. I'm not sure I understand why a 9 11 but, but I, I get, uh, I mean, I get you're saying that there may not have been issues necessarily for them to run on after uh, the, uh, Bill Clinton had basically mo- triangulated and, and taken a lot of space up, particularly of moderate Republicans. Many people refer to Bill Clinton as the best Republican president we've had uh, in some respects. But clearly, the things that you're talking about in this book preexisted that era, right? No, I mean, no, no, I get no. your metaphor about the dominant gene, mm-hmm. but what doesn't happen in the context of passing on genes is that one gene leverages another gene knowingly, right? Because you, you, I mean, I think in the book you allude to at least some awareness that 
that dominant, what whichever one was dominant or, or submissive, the, the relationship between them was not like genes. The relationship was like leverage and a tool. Look, um, I think the Republican Party had a, a, a dark side and a side that was very optimistic and aspirational. I don't think it was ever perfect. I never thought that. Um, but if you really think about what were sort of the basic principles that most people in the dark ages, say four years ago, would have agreed the Republican Party stood for. It would have been character counts, personal responsibility, free trade, um, pro-legal immigration. I mean, Ronald Reagan announced in front of the Statue of Liberty, signed a bill that made everybody in the country before 1983 uh, legal, um, strong on Russia. And now the party is not just drift away from those things, it's actively against those things. So, you know, when I wrote this book, there's a sort of trope of books about Washington, if only they had listened to me. Like John Bolton just wrote one of those. Right. I, 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 I didn't want to write that book because they did listen to me. Um, and I, I think if one of the reasons I was really drawn to the Republican Party is this concept of personal responsibility, it seems important to take personal responsibility as moving forward and trying to analyze it. So that's why in the beginning of this book, I say, blame me. I mean, I was part of this. Oh, I'm, um, I'm okay to blame you. I, mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I hope I'm not, but I'm just curious. As that to, out? Well, I mean, I, I mean, you know, I, you share the blame with a lot of people as far as I'm concerned, but, um, but like, so let's talk about some of those principles. I'm just curious about yep. even those, because like, okay. what does personal responsibility mean? Like, I mean, obviously you're saying blame me. Okay, fair enough. But what is that as a what political concept? What it meant was um, that, uh, well, let's take Donald Trump for example, right? Nothing that happens in Donald Trump's life is his fault. And he will take responsibility for nothing. So the opposite of that is a concept of personal responsibility. That um, if I go out and I commit a crime, that is an individual decision it is not a societal decision. It is a, a, I have free will here, that this is a choice that I make um, and that there is a good and there is an evil. And uh, there are societal elements in it, but ultimately that choice is mine. So it, it really is sort of like an empowerment of the individual. Um, if you are a person who treats others um, badly, if you're mean, if you're cruel, that, there are always reasons for that. You can justify it, but ultimately that responsibility is on you. And now that, ex I think that breaks down in a governing sense. You have to be very careful about that because there are large societal efforts here. And I think where conservatives went wrong, and I write about this, was looking at sort of uh, systematic poverty and trying to say if only individuals uh, worked harder or something, they have the ability to lift themselves out of poverty, um, which I think is really where that breaks down. Um, well, so but, where does it work? Like, like, but, but I'm because I mean, Donald Trump wasn't around when these when these principles that you're talking about were operative, right? As, and and when they were deployed, they were deployed against, I guess, I don't know, liberals or Democrats or whatever it was the the opposition was called at that time. And so I don't understand, like, if it doesn't apply to poverty, and you mentioned education uh, with George Bush, um, I'm not a fan of that, despite the fact that Ted Kennedy sent, I thought that that whole, and I didn't like the, the follow up with Obama either, but, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll stipulate that it was in reaction to feeling that education is important and we don't want to, you know, soft bigotry, et cetera, et cetera. But where does like, because it, to me, the whole personal responsibility thing also sounds like a lie. Like where, well, do, listen, where does I, it get I deployed? I mean, yes, if you commit a crime, you gotta, you gotta do the time. But, um, but this whole thing of like personal responsibility was deployed when Paul Ryan, uh, I know you were a campaign manager for, for Mitt Romney, you know, made up a story uh, of a made up story about brown bagging lunches and the kids shouldn't get free lunches because they feel better about having a, a brown bag lunch. Well, that's not, that's, I mean, 
that's fine, but that's nonsense. That's not the issue here. The issue is that the kids don't have the opportunity to eat, but personal responsibility comes into all this. Like where, when was it not a lie? Oh, listen, I think that there was a, uh, if you, if you go back, say, just focus on the issue of crime, right? There, there was a sort of, uh, philosophy that, uh, individuals really should not be held accountable, that there were larger societal, uh, forces at work that uh, took away this concept of free will for them to commit crime. And I think that's wrong. And I think that if you go to Bill Clinton, I mean, Bill Clinton really ran as, as sort of a reformist on that. I mean, he was the one you know, when he ran as a different kind of Democrat um, that he, he was saying that, that we should hold people responsible. He's the one who hired 100,000 new cops on the street. I mean, in many ways, sort of fascinating that the uh, 2016 Hillary Clinton campaign was running against the 1992 Bill Clinton campaign, um, which I actually look as a very positive sign for the Democratic Party, because I think parties need to change like that um, and grow. Um, so look, I, I think that these character counts. So if you go back and you read the stuff that William Bennett wrote about Bill Clinton uh, in the late 90s and the whole Monica Lewinsky thing, he wrote this beautiful stuff about how character is the soul of the nation and how the president is more important than one set of issues and another set of issues. We really need to, to hold that. Well, I believed all that, you know? I mean, I work for Bob Doe. I, I don't see why it doesn't apply to, to Donald Trump. I, I, it just boggles my mind that you could believe that then and not believe it now. Oh, so, you're, you know, you're talking the, about in terms of Republicans. Well, I mean, to be fair, Bennett, meanwhile, was also had a massive gambling problem and was using it to pay uh, off uh, dominatrix, which, you know, I'm not kink shaming anybody, but I'm just saying that, like, he's not in a position to be talking about, you know, uh, sexual piccadilla. I mean, he was lying. He was lying, too. He didn't believe any of that in that first place anyways. And everybody knew it at the time. Right. I mean, I listen, I knew it in 2004. And I would bet that you, because you're an insider, you knew that back in the 90s. So I guess my, from my question is how, how, what, what changed other than you found yourself, like, look, Donald Trump is a repugnant human being. And even if he's doing all the proposals that Mitt Romney would have done, the tax cuts, right? The self-deportation, uh, which is what the whole, you know, separating of the children was. Maybe Romney wouldn't have done that exact same policy, but the idea was you're similar. Wrong. You're wrong about that. Actually. Well, self-deportation is, is an existing term of art, which means make things so hostile here that immigrants go back. No, that actually, was a complete turnaround from- Let me get into that. Let me oh, get sure. into that. If you look at the debate that that occurred in, Romney was arguing against forced deportation. And there- in that debate, people were arguing that what we need to do is round these people up. And Romney said, no, what we need to do is we need to make the, the circumstances in their home country better so that they don't want to come to America. And we want people to leave on their own, which is basically the Obama policy, though Obama deported a lot of people, uh, so that they voluntarily will leave. And he came up with this sort of awkward, weird phrase, self-deportation. But if, but he didn't coin that. I mean, that was that was a term of art. I'd never heard it before. Okay, I'd never. It, I believe it existed. It pre existed. Sitting there in the debate, when I when I heard it sitting in the audience, I was like, well, "Where did that come from?" I'd, I'd never heard that before. Um, but that's actually an example. And you know, when it came up in the Romney uh, Obama debate, uh, Romney explained that, and, and Obama, to his credit, said, "Yeah, this is not." A, a really a fair charge against you in the sense that you were not arguing for forced deportation. And that really was, uh, there, there were elements in the Republican party at the time that were saying, you know, we need to round up 12 million people, which is an absurdity, it would never have happened. But look, you know, I, I, I go back to this, it, it's not just about policy, right? So you take George Bush after 9-11, right? You can, Iraq war is a disaster when we can, there's right. no need for us to, to, to argue with that. But the way that he responded uh, to say that we should not attack Muslims. Right. That's, that's really important. And you think, and so these things matter. And, and it, it's not just, well, he would have had the same policy and they would have had you know, the same policy maybe that Donald Trump would have invaded Iraq. But the quality of human being matters. And 
you know, one of the things that, but wait, but let me ask you this, because this is, this is another thing that I, that, that, that I, I, I struggle with because I think there's some, I think there's some truth to what you're saying, but I, and I don't know what I look, I don't know what's in Mitt Romney's heart one way or another about immigration, but I suspect that, you know, Ronald Reagan at one point was for open borders with Mexico. Mm-hmm. And like you mentioned at the beginning of this, he um, he uh, a- gave amnesty to, I think, three or four million immigrants. Mm-hmm. Um, Mitt Romney was reacting to all of those people in the party. The Republican Party that. And you know this, you worked for Bush 2004 or five. They tried to, maybe it was 2003. I can't remember exactly. They tried to push immigration reform and they got the Republican party. They were so out of step with the Republican party. He got slammed. That was the beginning of the end of his administration, as far as I can tell. Uh, So it was quite clear in the odds where the power was, at least on this issue within the Republican party, right? It's not a function it's only a function of the leader if they are pushing back against the worst inclinations of their people. It, it uh, actually, it, you know, to, to be clear, it actually was more where the country was. Because this is why Barack Obama never pushed for uh, broad, uh, comprehensive immigration reform when he had uh, the Senate and the House. Oh, wait, no, wait a second. There was an attempt to do it, and Rubio just abandoned the whole thing and left no, it at the we'll table. Go back to the- the first two years of his administration, when he had only had the House and the Senate, they never prioritized immigration reform. That's that's absolutely right. I mean, they had it. They they, they had it really for 16 months, a little bit less than 16 months. The, the the control because Franken didn't get sat until the summer, and they wanted to do health care and to do both of those things simultaneously. Now you could argue health care uh, immigration should have come first, and certainly I'm not going to defend Barack Obama's policies on immigration. He thought that he had to placate Republicans. And thought that he could. Well, it's, and- look, it's a more complicated issue than that, to be honest, because where the country was on immigration and where the country is today has changed, I think. It's like a lot of issues have changed. But it would be naive to say that the majority of Americans were for open borders. A majority of oh, Americans. No, of course. I agree no, with no, that. But, but just, or, or, that a majority of Americans. There, there is a resistance. Uh, in both parties to this idea of comprehensive immigration reform. And it's one of these things, I think, from when I talk to, to, to people in Congress and the Senate about this, about reform, what they would always say is, you know, if 90% of us, we could agree on this in a day, that it's the 10% on the extremes, on the left and the far right, that has stopped immigration reform. And it's a failure. I mean, most immigration reform, most immigration reform is pretty common sense. uh, Yeah, I mean, I I, my recollection of the multiple attempts to do immigration reform was that there weren't Republican votes. The certainly yes, not all Democrats. I'm not I'm not arguing that Republicans that Republicans uh, were pushing for this. I'm not. I agree. Um, I mean, but the but the obstacle. Okay, I mean, let we it's that we can argue as to whether what what the actual obstacle, some type of reform uh, was at that time. But I guess my point is that there were indications there of of all these things. And I'm curious as to how how you didn't see them. And and when we talk about I mean, let me ask you this, too, in terms of like personal responsibility, because, uh, you know, and like I say, Mitt Romney, I'm sure he's a nice guy. Uh, my, my whole thing is I try not to be friends or know anybody I can possibly know in politics. So I don't really assess them. Can I just say something? It's, it's a little bit condescending to say he's a nice guy. Well, okay. Because, because I I don't, I don't No, no, because if ever we've had a lesson, that character matters and the quality of the person matters, it's right now. So that that Mitt Romney stood up to Trump, that he called out Trump in April it's more than just being nice. He's actually been courageous about this, that he would vote, be the only person in his party that would vote for impeachment. So I think that- What's we the polling it, in Utah? I, I, he, Trump is going to win Utah by 10 points. I understand. But that's, that's, that's different than saying, uh, that's, that's different than saying that uh, he's got that, you know, he's not, not the highest favorability in Utah. I'm saying that, yes, okay. I mean, the courageous seems like a strong, let me just, let me, a couple of things that I remember about the 2012 election. Okay. I remember that secret tape from 
mm-hmm. the uh, the donors thing. Right. And, they, and, and everybody remembers the 47 percent. Right. That was where he said there are 47 percent of people out there who are not paying any taxes. He was referring to federal income taxes. Of course, they're paying wage, you know, the payroll taxes and they're paying sales taxes. And so but he was talking. He didn't specify income, but he just said they're not paying ta- taxes. And he got right into the maker taker uh, divide. And I mean, I don't know if that's an indication of personal responsibility. I mean, what what did you see when you were working on that campaign? I was in that room. I can tell you exactly what happened. Well, OK, well, so what was that about? I mean, well, where do you want ask someone asked, a, someone asked a question and said, you know, there's 47 percent of the country that's never going to vote for you. And why do you even campaign? Why do you spend time even trying to reach these people? So what Mitt did is what a lot of people do. He sort of repeated the question. He goes, yeah, there is 47 percent and they're never going to never going to reach us. Um, and then he went off on it. Listen, I, I think. Well, let me ask you. you this. Gotta, let me just wait a second. Yeah. Are you really trying to suggest that Mitt Romney is not a man of character? I, I like I say, I stipulated. I, if you want me to say, oh, I'm sure he's he a man nice. of character. I'm no, but I. You stipulated he was nice. Melania I'm, Trump is nice, I'm, probably. Uh, is she? I probably. don't know. I'm mean, okay, but, uh, but, but okay, if you want to say is, that he's a man of character. I, this, is, this is where I think we get into trouble, okay? Where I think we get into trouble is when we look at this so much through a partisan divide that when you see someone like Mitt Romney, who has stood up to Donald Trump, there's absolutely, when Mitt Romney went out there in April, was it, of 16, and stood up to Donald Trump, expecting others in the Republican Party to follow him, or maybe they wouldn't do it. There was absolutely no upside for him to do that, and he did. And when he went out and he voted for impeachment and when he called out, when he marched in Black Lives Matter. What was he doing? Well, I mean, I I don't want to get into an argument about about, uh, you know, whether he's a man of character or not. I'm just curious as to like, you know, how elastic that is. Let's stipulate he's a man of character. Like I say, I don't know him. You know him. But I'm talking about in that 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 tape, the thing that got lost in that tape that always struck me because you, you mentioned personal responsibility and I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, he said that he would have won the presidency by now if his dad was born in Mexico. And, his dad was born in Mexico. Uh, well, if, if, if his dad was born to, let's play, let's play the clip because I always found this really stunning because okay. his, dad, his dad was born in Mexico. Yeah. All right. Well then let's hear you. Yeah, um, Remember there's that whole thing about whether or not he was going to be legal because his dad was born. In if he was born of Mexican parents, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. He said, if he was born of Mexican parents, implying that if his last name was instead of Romney was like Ramirez, mm-hmm. that he said, and had he been born of Mexican parents talking about his dad, mm-hmm. I'd have a better shot at winning this. Sure. That's a fact. Are you arguing about that? Yeah. Why? Because had his last name been Ramirez, his yep. dad wouldn't have been governor of Michigan. His dad wouldn't have been president right. of AMC. Maybe. Like, well, like, uh, seriously? But, but, yeah, seriously. I'm sorry. You think that you think that that Romney's dad, also another man of great character, right. would have been governor of Michigan in the what was it in the 50s or the 60s? Had he been of Mexican descent? It's an unprovable. It is an unproven. What, what is your point? What's your my point? point is though, this is a guy who's sitting there saying the implication here is mm-hmm. that you get a leg up in this society. If I yeah, if right. my last name was remi- well, what that's is he total, supposed that, that, that's total bullshit? What, you're, what he's saying is, what he's saying is, uh, Hispanics are. An, if you just step back, Hispanics are an increasing percentage of the population. Right, America's becoming. George Bush got over forty percent that one of the failures of the Republican Party is appealing to Hispanics. And that we, the, why is the uh, Republican Party in California in third place now? Largely because of the aftermath of what happened in 1994, when Pete Wilson responded negatively. Right. As opposed, interestingly, to Texas, where George Bush was uh, governor, and they took a completely different uh, attitude toward it. He had better policies not, towards not the only reason, Latinos, better yes. It's also the difference in Tex-Mex culture. Sure. But so if Mitt Romney's 
last name, if he came from Hispanic parents, it's arguable, I think, in just a poli sci sense, that uh, his uh, appeal to Hispanic voters uh, could have been greater. But Doesn't here's my, no, it does make sense, but here's my, here's my issue with that. It completely erases the, where he, where he was positioned in life because of a, what his father had achieved, but mm-hmm. also because of, frankly, his father would not have achieved that had his name been Ramirez. He would not have been president of American Motors. He wouldn't have been any of those things well, because, yeah, well, because of the nature of our society. And so the, this is the, the, the canard that I think like, you know, that I, that I think is, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated about this notion of personal responsibility. That's the complete opposite of personal responsibility, isn't it? It's like, because personal responsibility also uh, means taking stock of like, what I have that isn't necessarily a function of, of, of anything other than, than pure luck. Yeah, listen, if you go back and you read what Mitt Romney has said about this, one of the criticisms he got was not talking about how wealthy he was, how he had made money. And he refused to do that. And, he, and a lot of people said, like in debates and things, like you shouldn't apologize for the fact that you're wealthy. I mean, you went out, you started this business with a couple of guys, you made a lot of money. He didn't inherit money. Um, he inherited every advantage in life. He inherited every, which he said before, but he didn't inherit money. Well, I mean, but, but, I specifically but, remember a comment where he was talking about they were living in the basement in, uh, in I think it was Somerville or Cambridge, and all they had to live on was like forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of stocks. No, uh, well, I remember that. I know mean, that was a quote. So I mean, I know it was a quote. It, it, but he wouldn't do that because his his whole thing was: Are you saying that? People should vote for me because I was lucky enough to make a lot of money. And a lot of it is luck. That makes me a better person because I'm wealthy. I mean, that's completely against every sort of article of faith and values that he was taught. And he never would do it. Um, It was really, I mean, we'd sit around and debate prep. And and I can remember Tim Pelini, who was uh, a great guy. He was governor of of Minnesota. Um, He would just say, like, Mitt, this isn't complicated. Don't be defensive about it. Be proud of the fact you made a lot of money. And Mitt would push back in this way and say, so that makes me a better person. So you should vote for me. Was because, that in the primary? Well, and in the general too. Look, you should vote for me. Newt Gingrich I, took a big chunk out of him. I, that, I, should though, right? make, I should make a lot of money because I made a lot of money. I'm a better person. Right. Well, really? Newt Gingrich. Well, but isn't, I mean, that was actually, I mean, that was, that was built into a lot of the Republican ideology at that time i mean and and for years right that that poverty is in some way a moral failure i mean let me put it this way when donald trump came along i don't think that you would call that a republican i think that you would call that i think you call it larger than that oh i think i think think you call you would have to call it american to try to just call that republican would be listen i can tell you i can tell you frankly childish i mean well first off i can tell you that um just in terms of Mormonism and, you know, that the um, the the prosperity gospel is very big there. And uh, knowing uh, some Mormons well, I can tell you that he would be very unique uh, within that church to feel that prosperity does not uh, uh, equal moral righteousness. But put that aside. I don't know. Well, uh, I will tell you this. Say though. That, 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 hold on a second. He ran for president in 2008. You never heard him say that. He ran for president in 2012. You never heard him say it in millions and millions of conversations. So I think that what that says about him is revealing. Okay. May be the case. Um, The idea that, uh, so let's just uh, pivot a little bit to this notion of like that, that the idea of, of, of within Republican circles, within conservative circles, the idea that money is not a moral righteous indicator. And that mm-hmm. poverty is not. I mean, all of that personal responsibility stuff really dovetails a lot. You think, with that's, it. A, you think that's a? You think that's solely? I will tell you idea. that on the day Donald Trump ran for uh, office, uh, I know exactly where I was. Uh, I walked into MSNBC, and I told everybody he is going to win the primary mm-hmm. because they have been building uh, the the Republican Party has been stitching a suit for years. 
and he fits it. Mm-hmm. And he's going to get on that stage. And there's literally countless hours. I am more money than all of you. I am better than you. Period. End of story. And every single Republican is going to buy it because that's what they've been taught for years. In fact, George Bush, the CEO presidency. Now, part of that, I guess, is the idea that he has some type of, uh, you know, technocratic skills, et cetera, et cetera, despite the fact that he might not have had necessarily as much of a CEO background as, as you know, but that's part of politics. I understand you create an image, but there is a notion there that if I have achieved this level of business success, yeah. then I have some measure of moral righteousness. You don't hear, uh, you know, Democrats sure you or, do. you know, a leftist uh, uh, promote that as an, as sure a, a, a real, sure you do. Sure. Tell, do tell. You think Kennedy would have been president if he had been poor? Do you, think I, Roosevelt, I, do you think Roosevelt would have been president if he was poor? Absolutely not. I think they used their money for this. Absolutely. But and I don't, don't think, think that, that you don't think that people looked at them as successful. I'm talking about their policies, though. See, this is the, I'm talking about their policies. And, you know, when 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 Paul Ryan says that kid wants the brown bag sent lunch, it's better for them. Look, I'm not here. I, I, I like Paul Ryan. I think Paul Ryan's a very good person. I'm not here to defend Paul Ryan. Well, I'm not asking to defend Paul Ryan. I'm, I'm using him as an example of a Republican ideology. You'd never heard Tip O'Neill talk like that. You never heard. No, but I've, I've heard, listen, there, there are countless millionaire Democrat candidates out there for governor who run for the Senate. John Y. Brown, who got elected in Kentucky, who ran on the fact that he was a millionaire, that he had been very successful in business. This is not a Republican. In Kentucky, it's a red state. I mean, I th- I'm sure. But he was a Democrat. What I'm trying to well, say is, it is, it is, it is, sim- it's simply wrong. And there's a larger indictment to be made here that I think you would agree with. It is wrong to say that the division in this as a value falls just between Democrat and Republicans, and that being a Democrat isolates you from this uh, this view. It's something that is part of American society. And I, I think there's good things about it in some ways. I think the aspirational qualities of it are good. They're, they're good parts of it. Where it's negative is when we don't recognize the large societal forces that make it difficult for people to succeed. And the, the fundamental problem, and I write about this in the, Repub- in, in the Republican Party, and I write about this in the book is, you know, there was the Ronald Reagan uh, thing that we all thought was funny, but summed up a philosophy. You know, the most dangerous words in the English language are, I'm here from the federal government to help. So how do you square that? Which is sort of a way to talk about smaller government and how government screws up things. And we all thought it was funny and true. How do you square that? Hold on. How do you square that with, say, the moment we're in now, where the federal government is what has to save us from this pandemic? How do you square that with the large number of people in the country on the lower economic uh, spectrum that see the federal government as one of their essential tools to rise in life? So what the, the point I make in this book, if you've actually read the book, is uh, when Republicans fail to attract African-Americans, there was a fault in the Republican Party by saying we just didn't know how to communicate with African-Americans. And uh, there was a whole cottage industry of African-Americans. How to talk to African-Americans, yes. Where, yeah, where it was a failure to acknowledge it was our policies that I think African-Americans understood us uh, completely well. And they didn't see what was being offered by the Republicans as having helping them in their lives, to put it in a very simple way. And, and that is the failure of it. And it's something that we've never addressed as a, as a party. And it's a continuing failure of the party. And, and it's- I think you would argue that they, 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 they did the opposite, right? I mean, cause small government may have been, you know, to some people been like, you know, government's a waste, it's bureaucracy. But uh, to a lot of people, what it meant was what Reagan meant when he went down to Neshoba County the Neshoba County Fair and for his general election announced that, you know, with a bunch of Confederate flags behind him, this is about state rights. We know what state rights means, right? I mean, that's right. I mean, like, so are you asking me to defend Reagan? 
No, no, no. I'm not asking you to defend Reagan. I guess I'm still trying but to get at we, this is. Can we talk all... about that for a second? Because it's an interesting point, okay? So I'm a seventh generation Mississippian. I grew up going to Shelby County Fair. And for years, I defended Reagan at that for going there because Mississippi was a swing state. Carter carried it. We forget that, you know. And it was important for him to carry. And politicians go to Neshoba County all the time. Of course. I mean, you know, the most, what passes for liberal Democrats in Mississippi at the time, I mean, everybody goes to Neshoba County Fair. So I defended it for years. But when I was writing this book, I went back and I, I reread the speech. And I think what he didn't say is very important. And, and I think that it was a failure. And I, I write about that. And I think it's part of how I see it differently now than I did then. Um, and he should have. Um, he, he should have acknowledged it. To be that close to where Shorna Cheney and Goodman were buried and not to talk about it um, was a failure. And- uh, But do you think it was just an omission or do you think it was a conscious effort to stimulate a reason because the I mean think about this this is what sort of like shocks me about it when I when I revisit that mm -hmm. the it was fourteen years maybe from nineteen what was it, fourteen years difference three is when it happened so, six, right. seven, so seven, 80. 17, 17 years I got four twenty five on SAT math so yeah I'm, I'm not so good on math in these parts either um, but nevertheless like we're twenty years past when it would be the equivalent time having passed, right? I mean, that would be like, I don't, I mean, that to me does not seem like he should have mentioned it. It, se it seems to me like he purposely was mentioning something else that either by omission or by yeah, talking about states' rights. Now, maybe I'm just, I'm jaded and I'm cynical about it, but where I'm just curious. Where it breaks down though, you know, where, that, where it kind of breaks down is if you look at the Democratic you know, when, G when Jimmy Carter came to Mississippi, he didn't talk about Schwerner, Jenny, and Goodman. And it's interesting. Did he talk that, about states' rights, though? Well, actually, probably he did. <laughs> Carter would do that kind of thing. But it, 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 I think it's a, a failure. Of, I mean, the, did you know about way, Lee, Water, Lee way Atwater's way. perspective on this? Listen, I, I wrote a whole chapter on this. You know, right. you're sort of, I mean, I'm the guy that said race was the original sin of the Republican Party. So I, don't, don't. Not don't the only one. Don't but argue yeah. with me with this. Okay? No, no. I, I, like, I, I know. I, just, let me just say this. I think as a society, we are in a, a very different place in our recognition of the civil rights era. And I, I think that um, it, say in Mississippi, you know, it was only until the last four years we had a civil rights museum. And uh, it's extraordinary if you go there. Um, you know, Ida, uh, Ida Bay Wells may be the most famous Mississippian, I mean, most accomplished Mississippian Ida Bay. I grew up, I never studied her. You know, it's fascinating, you know. And um, the way that, uh, the, the larger issue to me is, is the whole way in which the Civil War was cast, the whole lost right. cause, and um, that that culture. I mean, I very much grew up in that, uh, and I, I grew up in a family that um, was, you know, there's a phrase in Mississippi that was used a lot, you know, good on race or bad on race. So I grew up in a family that was very moderate on race, and in fact, I'm writing a novel now about white civil rights workers, because when I was a kid, my mother had this way of collecting people. And our basement was always filled with these white civil rights workers who were coming down from the north. And they were kind of these mythic figures to me, you know. Um, so, uh, but we still were part of that lost cause. I mean, I, I wrote a book um, after the Romney campaign. Um, I wrote a book. Uh, my dad had just turned 95. And... Uh, part of the way we had sort of bonded when I was a kid was going to college football games, particularly Ole Miss football games. And I, I wrote a book called The Last Season in 2013. He and I, my mom, which kind of gave it a driving Miss Daisy quality, um, went to all the Ole Miss football games. And I used that as a framework to write about race a lot and to write about how the South is changing. Um, and it, you know, to get to, to the sort of sadness of this moment. So finally, the Mississippi legislature, six weeks ago or so, voted to take down the Mississippi state flag, which was basically the Confederate battle flag. Right. 
And then that same week, Donald Trump gets in a fight with NASCAR over taking down the flag. I mean, it's extraordinary. So you met Republicans are on the wrong side of a cultural war with NASCAR. I mean, it, it's just, I think Donald Trump's whole view of where society is now is wrong. I mean, the, these, these, take your average teenager living in the Mississippi, you know, white teenager. He'd lot rather be a, a black rap star than Robert E. Lee. I mean, that, that whole world is just past. And I think his whole view of suburban subur suburbs you're talking about suburban women. I, I don't think people in the suburbs, they don't want their kids to think that if someone who is of a different religion or race moves next door, that they're not going to be reach out to them in kindness. I think he's knock, knock on wood, knock on wood, but he does know where the Republican party is. Right. I mean, that's why, that's why, I mean, let me ask you this. Nick. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't know where the Republican party is, why is it that Lindsey Graham, Susan Collins, Mm -hmm. Joni Ernst, um, I could go uh, Cory Gardner, uh, 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 Martha McSally. Uh, I mean, we, where is, um, and, you know, Romney has said a couple of things. Definitely he's stood up to him. We don't hear from him that much. Go ahead. But, um, but the only other uh, Republican uh, I can remember who really spoke up against uh, Trump is now uh, an independent, is he even in Congress anymore. I mean, he's going to leave. Um, what Wait, if, uh, no, no, not Flake, uh, uh, from Michigan, the, the congressman who's uh, the libertarian. The oh, okay. uh, um, yeah, he left the party. If, if let me put it this way if Donald Trump doesn't know the Republican Party, the voters, but, 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 then listen, why is every there's, politician there's, afraid there's, to buck him? I wrote a book that said Donald Trump is the Republican Party, so we have no argument over this, right? Okay, I, I mean, I, I, I think. Uh, my premise is that Donald Trump didn't hijack the Republican Party, that the Republican Party became Donald Trump. So, and look, I'm the guy waking up every day in the Lincoln Project trying to beat these people. So, Let's talk about the Lincoln Project. So, a little bit. I mean, I, I what, what I don't, I, I, listen, I spent 30 plus years pointing out flaws in the Democratic Party. So I've got plenty of credentials there. But what I've said is that, that I will work in the Democratic Party because I think that really the Democratic Party represents uh, what is gonna be the future of America. Because there's, there's really three parties in America now I see. You know, there's Republican Party, which is increasingly irrelevant and says no. And there's really kind of two parties inside the Democratic Party, an AOC party or Bernie Sanders and say Joe Biden. And the result of that fight, uh, debate, whatever, is gonna decide the future of our policy. I mean, in 20 years, are we not going to be, are we still going to be the only country that doesn't have national health insurance in Western democracy? Of course not. What that's going to be isn't going to be decided in the Republican Party. I mean, they've had a chance and they've already said no. So that to me is what it is. So I, I see the Republican Party as becoming, I, I look at California as the future of the Republican Party. So look, it's, man, I will. Anyway, I just interviewed uh, Jean Guerrero, who wrote a book about Stephen Miller and made that exact same point yeah. that she thinks, but what you just said before that is actually um, the biggest concern I have with the Lincoln Project. And it's funny that the Lincoln Project came up so close into that notion of, of you working in the Democratic Party and of this divide that you see in the Democratic Party. Because that's actually, for me, the reason why I wanted to sit down with you. Because from okay. my perspective, that's the biggest... Um, that's the biggest issue I have with the Lincoln project is that I'm not clear what the Lincoln project is really about. And I think to a certain extent, your perspective gives a little bit of a hint, which is this is about defeating Donald Trump, a priority number one, no doubt, because it has to happen both sequentially and in terms of, I think, you know, for a whole host of other reasons. But there's a B there that I think people, Democrats, people on the left should be very aware of, which is if they're like you, maybe they aren't. I don't Again, I don't know them. Um, they see the future in the Democratic Party, and it's time for us to weigh in and uh, stop and define where the Democratic Party goes. And so I see stuff no, on the listen, link. First of all, 
you know, I can't speak for the Lincoln process. And um, it, well, you work with it, but what do you? I'm, what I'm working it? with them, but I, I think uh, each individual involved in the Lincoln Project, if you sat down, would have variations of different answers to this question. You know, because really, it, it's it's a What's little. What's your answer to it? It's a little bit like asking somebody about their. Are you worried about your cholesterol count in a knife fight? It's like, well, yeah, I am, but I'm like more important than in a knife fight. So I think these are great questions for November 4th, November 5th, November 6th. It, 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 look, we're people that works in the Republican Party, right? And we have certain skills. So we had sort of three choices in this. We could either support Donald Trump, well, like that's not gonna happen. Or we could have set it out. Or we could work to defeat Donald Trump. So that's what we're doing. And we don't confuse ourselves with trying to save the nation or, you know, we don't, we don't see ourselves as personally heroic. We're just like men and women, they just kind of know how to do some stuff. And you guys are like those, um, what are those, uh, not the, the Japanese, um, uh, you're, you're, I mean, you're a mercenary on some level. It's a mercenary thing, no, right? I mean, you a have a skill set. It's not a mercenary thing because we'd be making a fortune working for Donald Trump. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, if, if, uh, you know, if at this point, I mean, uh, about, you know, they, Donald Trump, he's the most transactional person on the planet. Right? I, I know if that. I went on, if I went on television, I've often even thought of doing this as an experiment, but if I went on television for three weeks and wrote pieces saying, look, I was wrong about Donald Trump. I finally get it. At the end of that three weeks, I could be running the Donald Trump campaign. Okay. Well then let me put it this way. You, I mean, you in particular, I think of the people in the uh, Lincoln project, there may be others who are similarly situated. You have, you have a skill set, right? You, you have, you're a samurai and uh, you, you have a skill set and it's not necessarily, there is, you, you do have some measure of a code. Uh, it's not just about money, but there are other people in there who are political strategists. And it's funny because I critiqued a Lincoln project ad or a tweet at one point, and somebody tweeted back to me, they're trying to get um, Donald Trump, um, you know, uh, the defeated. And I just don't think they're that calculating that they're also trying to position themselves in the coalition that defeats him so that they have a seat at the table. I'm expanding on what, what but that was my point. And for me, when I look at a cadre of political strategists and I think, are they calculating? I think, they're the most calculating human beings on the planet. They're literally paid to. They're successful because they are trying to look two or three steps down the road that we're setting up legislation in September of 2017 to pass in, in, in December of 2019. I mean, that's what political strategists do. They push here and they expect an impact, you know, down the road. And so for me to assume that nobody in the Lincoln Project is thinking, we're going to raise money, we're going to appeal to the left and to Democrats, because, look, I appreciate the work you're doing. I'm not convinced there's a constituency there for it. The ads are good. That's all well and good, but it, none of it's on policy. And I'm quite convinced that, like, I mean, this referendum uh, might work against Donald Trump, might not. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of that's reasons. Not, that's not true, by the way, that the ads aren't on policy. Look, what, what is by far the number one issue in the country? The economy. There are more Americans out of work this August than any August in the history of the country. More Americans have died of a disease in the last five months than have ever died for in the history of the country. That's policy. That's 100% policy. If we had the same rate of death as Germany, 140,000 Americans would still be alive. They have 111 per million. We have 544. That is policy. Oh, no, I and agree. You have, a, you, have a, you have a confluence of uniquely deadly circumstances here. This um, increase of anti-science attitude in the Republican Party that merges with this anti-elite part of the Republican Party, which is completely phony, which merges with this anti-big government and it's a sort of toxic, perfect storm that has killed tens and thousands of Americans, which has ruined our economy, which is destroying the fabric of American life. When your kid can't go to school, 
when you, you, you lose your job because you have to stay home to take care of your kid because there's not daycare because no one will do that. That's policy. That's incompetent government. Now, part of that is character. Donald Trump is a gangster and he runs the uh, government like a gangster uh, operation. You know, the person in charge of COVID is the person who's sleeping with his daughter. That's how gangsters operate and who tried to set up his own friends. So th- th- these are these are the big policy issues of our time, right? I, I, I would, ag- I would, I would, ag- I would and, agree. Yeah, and, and so look, I, I think it's a fair question to ask. So are the, are the political consultants in the Biden campaign plotting to take over the Democratic Party? It's kind of, listen, let me tell you something. In the Biden campaign? Yeah. I mean, are they going to try to kill the AOC wing? I don't think so. They're going are to- the political, uh, uh, I, there is no doubt in my mind that the political, uh, that, that a, at least a percentage of the political um, operatives in the Biden campaign are, uh, are definitely trying to fend off the uh, AOC wing of the party. Of course. And do you think that that's why they're for Biden? That they're not trying to just beat Trump? Because they're trying to do something good for the country. Oh, the people on the Biden campaign. Well, I think that they're. I think many of those people are 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 hoping to have influence in a Biden administration. I don't think their only goal is to uh, to, to defeat the uh, AOC wing of the party. But of yeah. course, I know people who work on campaigns. They're yeah. they're contemplating working in administrations. Well, listen, I did this for thirty years. I elected more Republicans than anybody else out there. Presidents here abroad. I never worked in administration. I never wanted to. I never thought that I'd be good. Well, at no. It. I mean, I think. Listen, I'm ta- I'm talking about the Lincoln Project, and like you say, you can't talk for other people. But you know, uh, Bill Crystal, um, others, they want to have influence. They can have influence by writing in a, a magazine. They can have influence because they've built a constituency. So what's, of- what's your point? Oh, my point is, is that I think people on the left should be very skeptical of the, uh, of the Lincoln project. I'm okay with what you guys are doing, obviously, uh, defeat uh, Donald Trump. We live, in a, we live in a binary world. Okay. We either going to be for Trump or against Trump. You agree we should be against Trump. Totally. Okay. Second question. Do you think we should try to use our skills that we have to defeat Trump? Yeah, I okay. do. So we're agreed on that. Okay. That's all that matters right now because that's all we're doing. There's not some giant conspiracy out there, you know. I don't think it has to be a giant conspiracy. There's not, there's not even I mean, a little conspiracy. Well, there's I, not even there's not even that. It, it this would well, be wait a second. Wrong, this, Stuart, this, let me ask you this. Can you yeah. tell me why Bill Crystal's doing this? I I think Bill Crystal is doing this because I think that he's a guy. But you don't he, know. No, hold on a second. I, I get you asked my opinion. Okay. You're right. I don't know, but I can give you my opinion. Okay. I think he's a guy who's 60 something who spent his life working for something that he believed in, that he thought was gonna to come to a greater good, who looks at it and is appalled at sort of what we have wrought. And I think that he sees that the conservative movement failed. I think he sees on, on multiple levels. I think he sees that, that what he thought was going to happen didn't happen and it sickens him. And I think that he's somebody because unlike me, that's actually his world. I don't live in Washington. I haven't lived in Washington in a million years. I mean. Most of my friends don't even know who the president is. I have like these extreme sports friends, you know, so it hadn't affected me socially. I don't get invited to those parties anyway. If I did, I wouldn't go. So, but the guy like Crystal does. So it's really had an impact on his life. You know, he's lost a lot of friends. He lost his magazine. Weekly Standard was shut down because they wouldn't support Trump. He paid, a, you know, a, a serious price in that sense. I think he's appalled. I think he's saddened. And I think he wants the country to be rid of Trump. And I think that uh, he and I probably have a difference when it comes to the Susan Collins of the world and um, Corey Gardner's. And I can debate that round or flat, but I know where I am. Um, but I think that's it. I don't think it's really that complicated. I think Steve what, Schmidt. Oh, I know where Steve, I thought to Steve, you know, talking to him 10 minutes ago. Steve says, thinks this is a national crisis. He thinks that this is the greatest threat to the country since the Civil War. And I actually agree with Steve on this. I think the next 60 days are the I most I was worried dangerous. about Howard Schultz, I got to tell you, though. The but most dangerous. That was a cash. That was a cash yeah, situation. The most dangerous period, I think, that we've had since the Civil War are in the next 60 days. I, I, I agree. I agree totally. I guess I just look at things like, um, you know, uh, 
uh, having been on uh, going on MSNBC for 15 years and watching their entire, um, you know, a lot of former Republicans who are talking about uh, Trump is bad. And then on the day that we bombed Syria, um, it is right back into the same sort of uh, Republican posture. The um, we've got to do this. We'll figure it out. The generals will take care of it for this guy. He's a lunatic, but we should also let him bomb countries uh, in this instance. It's, I mean, separate. it's a separate discussion. Well, to you. Listen, no, well, it is a separate discussion. Look, who do you guys, who do you, who does the Lincoln Project, what votes are they moving, do you think? Oh, our goal is to take 4% of Republicans away from Trump. What's, what what's your sense of how that's going? It's going well. Yeah. How many, I mean, can you see in so here, Here's a perfect, here's a perfect example. Because I don't see it in polling. Yeah, you see it in polling. Look how much smaller the Republican Party is. Trump. Well, oh, but that's not a function of, of I mean, that, it, it, I mean. Sure it is. It's, it's, well, it's, it's a function of something that's happening. Now, why it's happening, you never, causality in politics. Is right, I understand. Established. But when you see Trump having these numbers of, you know, 90 plus percent support, and he says 95, he lies about everything, but say it's 88 percent. It's a much a significantly smaller group of people who are identifying themselves as Republicans now. And this is really important. So let me give you a perfect example, Wisconsin. Romney loses Wisconsin by seven. Trump wins Wisconsin by one. But here's the dirty little secret. Mitt Romney got more votes. More votes, right. So, you know, I wrote a piece about this yesterday in the Washington Post, which is why I think what's happening in Wisconsin is very good for Democrats now. Um, the, the, why did Donald Trump win with 46.1 when Romney lost with 47.2? Really for two reasons. Third party vote increased, it doubled over 2012. Well, that's not gonna happen again. I think we can all agree. Right. And uh, non-white turnout, specifically African-American turnout, declined for the first time in 20 years. So this is a very simple race here. And Republicans understand this. This is why voter suppression is gonna be a huge issue in this race, is a huge issue in this race. Um, the country is increasingly becoming less white. Their share of non-white vote is either stagnant or declining. So it's simple math. They, for them to win, they have to reduce the percentage of non-white vote as part of the total electorate. And it's, uh, it's, it's simple math. So I think that we're serving um, a very, well, there's a lot of things we're doing. I mean, this morning, Donald Trump attacked us because we put out a spot talking about how his ratings were better than Donald, uh, were worse than Biden's. So what does that mean? Okay, the one thing that every campaign has the exact same amount of is time. So today, uh, hours of the Donald Trump campaign are being spent attacking the Lincoln Project. I mean, we wouldn't vote for ourselves. Are you crazy? We're like political consultants. We like laughed at this. It's like, dude, it's insane. And that's a day he's not attacking Joe Biden. Right. And, and, and that's a good day. And you know, they go out and they drop this oppo on us and stuff. We just laugh. We don't care. Um, so we know how to get in their heads. We know these people. All these, these, these sort of crooks and castoffs around Trump. This isn't, they're working in their first presidential campaigns, not because all of a sudden they woke up and wanted to work in presidential campaigns. They've been trying to get in presidential campaigns for years. I've done five of them. Nobody would hire these people. And like Jason Miller used to be my intern. I wouldn't hire Jason in a million years. So um, we know how to distract them. And that's a very useful, in war, that's a useful thing. When to create confusion, I think we had a large role in them firing Brad Parcells. We attacked Brad Parcells, pointed out he was a crook, probably, and stealing money, probably, uh, and they got rid of him. That lost them two weeks. So now who do they have? They have this guy, Bill Stepien, who, you know, I did Chris Christie's races, he was a campaign manager, Good luck. Um, so, uh, I, and I doubt he'll be there come November. Um, that's useful in, in a campaign. So um, now you look at the first to leave Donald Trump are 
the last to have joined him, which makes sense. If you watch 2016, at the very end, you decided to vote for Donald Trump. You had a lot of doubts about Donald Trump. So it makes sense that you would be the first to leave Donald Trump. Right. And, and those, the, the perfect example, those are college educated women who voted for him. And I think we've been very good at going after those women. The other thing that is really unexpected in this race is Donald Trump is starting to lose seniors. Yes. The reason Florida is tightening is because he's losing seniors. And why is he losing seniors? Because he's, he's the killing party them. wants to kill them. He's yes. killing them. Right. So uh, I think we're very good at this, uh, being able to appeal to that. Um, so listen, um, no, nobody in the Lincoln Project wants to work in the Biden administration. We don't want to be ambassadors. We don't want to be, you know, anything. We just want to beat the guy and we want to beat Trumpism. And, and then what happens after you guys do that? Do you go back? We're and not, for the first of all, stop. We're not going to do that because whatever happens, if Trump loses, you haven't defeated Trumpism. It, it's still going to continue in the party. And I'll give you a perfect example. Yes. There's sort of another Republican party out there. And that's these popular governors uh, in blue states, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, uh, Larry Hogan, Larry Hogan. Phil Scott here in Vermont, where I'm sitting right now. I've worked for all those guys. I love those guys. If the Republican Party had any sense, they'd be studying these guys going, you're selling our product in the hardest market. Like, what can we learn from you? Instead, they kind of treat them with benign neglect. But here's what's really telling. None of those guys can pick their own state party chairman, which is unimaginable in politics. I mean, like, you're a governor, you're popular, you can't pick your own state party chairman. I mean, it would be like saying, like, you know, you couldn't decide what to have for lunch. Let, let me just that just, just show how far Trumpism is in the party. I just want to illustrate what you're saying for people who don't understand the dynamic. In other words, the Republican parties in these parties, generally the chief executive gets yeah. to put that person in the same way that like you, if you're president of the United States, you choose who the, uh, the chairman of the Republican party is. You put your person in there. They can't do it because the actual Republican party, not the leadership yeah. or may, middle management and down at the very least in those states, sometimes top management it's in true. Washington are, that's what Republicans are. Yes. Well, I mean, this is, listen, I'm the guy that wrote the book that said that. I, I, mean, I, I know that's, yeah. you're the only one I would have on. I just want you to know that, <laughs> which, which I don't know that you're terribly excited about at this point. But, um, but I, I do appreciate you coming on. No, no, listen, um, I, I think what, what's happened now, it's always difficult when you're in the middle of something to kind of realize the impact of it. But I don't think we've seen anything like it. I think we've seen a complete total moral and philosophical collapse of a major party in America. And uh, really the only thing I can liken it to is the collapse of communism uh, in the Soviet Union, where what the party said it was for and what it actually delivered was so disparate that it just kind of collapsed. So um, I think this is, there is a market for center-right party in America. But right now, I don't think anyone who's a conservative, Republican, with any credibility can tell you what conservatism is. They can't, what is it? I mean, we're to the left of Bernie Sanders on trade. I mean, Bernie honeymoons in Russia, but it, you know, he didn't like sleep with Putin. We're, we're incoherent on uh, the issues of, of character counts and personal responsibility. So. You know, say what you will about Elizabeth Warren. She has a theory of government. She can defend it. She can articulate it. You can argue with it. You can love it. You can hate it. But there's a theory there. And it's logical and it holds together. There's no such thing on the Republican side now. And eventually that will emerge. But I think it's going to, I think we're in for a period of center left government for a good while now. And I, probably uh... eventually it'll go too far and something will come out of it. But I'll leave you with one statistic, okay? Just so you realize like how you're gonna own the future. So you can maybe feel better about this. Americans 15 years and under, the majority are non-white. So the odds are really good they're gonna be 18 and non-white. And that is a death sentence for the Republican party as it is now. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I agree with uh, um, uh, certainly some of what you say. I sort of had that same opinion of the Republican Party, I don't know, over the past 20 years, but um, better late than never, I guess. But um, uh, appreciate your time, Stuart Stevens. 
Uh, it was all a lie how the Republican Party became Donald Trump. Really appreciate your your patience ahead, and uh, your uh, your hanging with us. Thank no, you so I much. It. All right, bye bye. Take care. We will uh, put a link to that book on our website. Interesting uh, conversation. Guess we'll we'll see down the road what um, some of these folks do. Um. All right, uh, just a reminder, this uh, program relies on your support. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, when you do, you support the uh, free show, and we give you bonus content every day. So, um, and uh, I just got a text Sam, did you listen to Stuart Stevens on Chris Hayes' podcast? It's almost unsettling how the man was able to repeat whole portions of that interview with you today, virtually verbatim, even with you being a more challenging, hostile host. You know, I, I read, I, I read some interviews with him, and that that was consistent with what I read as well. Um, the guy's pro. The guy's on message. Pro. On message. I appreciate um, his endurance. That was his fun. endurance and. He's out there. He's fighting the good fight. Um, still, he persisted. Still, he persisted. Still, with he Sam, and that we were all better for it. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't do think, think I don't think Rick Wilson would have lasted that long. I don't think Rick Wilson would have, and I think Steve Schmidt would have walked off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, what he did not say in this interview that in in many interviews that I I read him. He did say, he said, like, I'm not a government guy. I just ran the campaigns. And um, which I think is true on some level. I still think like this whole personal responsibility stuff. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't really know what that means. Yes, you should be a better person than Donald Trump. But I don't think that like anybody from the most conservative Democrat to the most uh, left-wing critic of the Democrats would say, well, I don't know about that. Like, I, I don't, I just don't think that anybody has a principle that says you, you can be a jerk and an a-hole and a criminal. And, you know, it's not really, you don't really have to take any responsibility for that. Um, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't know. I want to request a feature from the Lincoln Project, though. A lot of those guys must have interesting correspondence from their time working on all those GOP campaigns and stuff. It'd be interesting to go to an archive where you can sort by the Lincoln Project figure and all the correspondence. That's embarrassing to all those people of who course. are helping of to course. perpetuate this lie. If you really want to put an end to that, that you will you will do that. But there, there's a certain amount of hedging that's going on. And. Uh, make no mistake about it. I think the most telling part, and if I was to say clip a part of that interview, maybe a couple of them, it would be when he starts talking about the Lincoln project and then immediately pivots into maybe I'm being a little too armchair psychologist here, but it's interesting that the first time the Lincoln project comes up, almost the next sentence is the Republican party is dead. There's going to be a, there's going to be two parties and then one's going to be the Biden party and one's going to be the AOC party. And I want to be part of the, uh, you know, the, the Biden party. Um, I think that like, and I don't know if he's talking about himself or he's just talking about an ilk of people, but that's my concern with the Lincoln project. Now, obviously they exist and that's great. And sometimes they make good ads that are pointed towards uh, suburban women I don't know if David Cross is the best vehicle for that. A David Cross stand-up thing? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, but uh, some suburban that, women appreciate Cross. Well, I've made I've made the point before that what they do in Hollywood, and that guy, incidentally, spent a lot of time in Hollywood, was a writer for Northern Exposure. Uh, he's written TV. I think he's probably written movies. And he probably knows something about casting. When they want parents to go to a cartoon, I can tell you this. My son, that when he watches Wreck-It Ralph, does not care that it's Sarah Silverman in that movie. 
In fact, I put him on the phone and said, you want to talk to whatever the character is with Sarah? And he's like, whatever. Uh, but dad, mom, they're like, oh, it's Sarah Silverman. I'll watch that. And that's part of the reason, like what, you know, that voiceover, they, the main message is what he's saying, but they're trying to hit another subset of people uh, with who's saying it. And I'm sorry, uh, maybe I'm just a, a conspiracy nut, but um, <laughs> I think that it's very hard for me to believe that political strategists are not calculating that they don't have a, um, a strategy beyond, you know, the first hill, as it were. I find that hard to believe. They're not thinking about their cholesterol while they're in a knife fight, Sam. I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, even on this show, with the limited resources we have, we th like, I'm already starting to think, like, what if Biden wins? What if Trump wins? Like I'm, I'm contemplating. I mean, I'm sorry. They do this. And yeah. to think that they don't is um, almost as condescending as I think you have to be when you play off a lot of these, um, these uh, racial tropes onto your voters and just think that like, eh, they'll buy it. And they do. <laughs> just as condescending as saying he's, he's a good guy. Yeah, I do like his optimistic vision, though, of the chances for a workers party in the United States. I, w one can hope. One can hope. But um, I don't know. I, but he is good. That guy is good. He's pro. Super pro. And um, what he also knows is that it was probably, as far as he was concerned, it was probably a race to see who could um, be more apologetic? Like, who, you know what I mean? Like he's competing, his competition right now are the other never Trumpers. And so he needs to get out there and be like, I'm gonna even go further than you guys, <laughs> but I'm still gonna hold on to these core principles. Like th this is the thing that I that ha had to, um, <laughs> Lincoln Project, we need a ho new host body. The the thing that just sort of like gets me is like his argument is the, you know, not that the Republican Party walked away from him. It's that he didn't realize who the Republican Party was. But then he says, like, they got away from their core principles of bullshit, bullshit and bullshit. <laughs> from my perspective, not from his perspective. So I don't know what personal responsibility means. I honestly don't. If it doesn't mean the poors need to pull up their own bootstraps. I don't know what it means. Um, if, you know, free trade, like what, you know, I don't know what exactly what he's talking about with free trade is the most nebulous term that there could possibly be. Um, no, uh. no willy nilly tariffs, <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> It's the right wing of neoliberalism. Yeah, I guess. But I mean, or like the normal wing, globalization, uh, open borders for capital, all that stuff. Right. Which fundamentally hasn't changed. He's getting into yeah. a couple of battles about uh, tariffs. Uh, that's yeah. all. Yeah. And by the way, uh, the Republicans did not support immigration rights out of any kind of moral impetus. No, of course not. But that's that's fine. I don't uh, afford any moral impetus to, you know, the, the 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 Democratic leadership any more than I do the Republican leadership per se. But um, I mean, I, 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 you know, Romney got up there and was talking about self-deportation. That's a long way from, you know, uh, 25 years earlier where Ronald Reagan is giving amnesty to immigrants mm -hmm. and self-deportation people can look it up that's a real thing that pre-existed Mitt Romney saying that he didn't just make that up he didn't make up the term self-deportation now maybe um Stuart Stevens was not privy to policy discussions that uh Ro Romney had but I don't mm -hmm. know I don't know all right mm -hmm. um 
Again, uh, join the majority report.com. Also, AM Quickie, sign up for that bad boy. Uh, you can uh, get that for free. We got merch. We're about 14 days and counting, maybe, I think, until the launch of the Carpenter Pen uh, Pencil Set. You're going to get blown away by this, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody in the audience is going to be using Carpenter Pencils. Jamie. Um, oh, and don't forget, uh, check out um, uh, Nomi Show. Uh, they're posting new stuff all the time. Uh, YouTube.com slash the Nomiki show. And Jamie, what's happening on the Antifada? This week on the Antifada, Sean and I, uh, we broke down some of the tragic news out of Los Angeles, Kenosha, and Portland, and then used it as kind of a jumping off point for a discussion of political violence, what that means and um, how the left should take, a, like what is the least LARPy line we could possibly take on this in this day and age? Um, I think it's a good thing that we take violence more seriously than the right does. So we talked a little bit about that and theories of revolutionary organization and spontaneity. Um, then in the second half, I teased this a while back, but it's out now. Um, I spoke with three worker organizers from No Evil Foods, well, they don't work there anymore, but uh, they were working for this vegan food company with uh, radical branding. But turned out when the workers tried to form a union, um, they used the same old capitalist union busting practices as any company that does not name their uh, fake meat after the Zapatistas. So uh, that's out now. Patreon.com slash the Antifada. What does that mean? LARP, LARP, LARP. Oh, it's uh, it stands for live action role playing which is like a really nerdy game that, uh, you know, dudes in high school play like Dungeons and Dragons, but you're like right. using a stick and pretending it's a sword. This is often applied to leftists who have these kind of revolutionary fantasies where they're going to like form a red army in secret and rise up and have some sort of glorious revolution. I get called a LARPer sometimes. So I felt like it was important to, uh, address these because it, I think it's important for uh, for the left, for the anti-capitalist left to take revolution seriously at the same time that we don't descend into this kind of fantastical LARPing. Live action role play. I actually saw my first LARPers in the wild uh, driving back from Massachusetts a few weeks ago. They you were they a like, lot out there. Like, uh, were they doing um, were they like doing... swords and stuff? Yeah. I will admit uh, to playing some tabletop games in high school, but I never went full LARP. I, uh, one of my characters in Beat Cops was a LARPer, I guess. <laughs> he would go to like Renaissance fairs and dress up as, uh, as uh, 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 the, the Knights of the Round Table guy. Yeah, it's like vi the video game era Renaissance fair. It, it used to be, you could see there were guys in, um, and girls, I guess, I mean, men and women, I should say, uh, in like Union Square, and I think I saw them in Central Park, you know, maybe this is 20 years ago, where they would uh, be doing that with swords, mm -hmm. just like recreationally. I feel like there's a, maybe you remember this, Jamie, Ren Fairs have like a communist history or something like that. I don't know. Maybe, what? That's, for, maybe that's a future Antifada episode. Um, Interesting. You'd think the people who fetishize feudalism would not be communists, but, uh, you know, it takes all kinds to make a world. <laughs> uh, Matt, go ahead. Uh, last night on TMBS, we had Malika Jabali on. She was in Kenosha. We talked about you know, the coordination between the militias and the cops and how that led to murder on the streets of Kenosha and, you know, the whole right wing reaction in the upper Midwest and how that's not exactly a great, maybe the worst place for black people in America in terms of certain economic indicators. Um, and also uh, a no Olympics activist, Albert Corrado talks about, he lost his sister, Melly Corrado to a cop. Uh, and they tried to cover it up. We talked about that also. So a pretty heavy uh, police violence show last night. And David Griscom talked about capitalism's new play for oil in Kenya, which is to flood it with plastics. So uh, check that out. Patreon.com slash TMBS. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Are you ready?
What, who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back, back, back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, 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 I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Dannerty's song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Dannerty. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, fucking reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Homo says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? Uh, Did we just lose sound? I think we maybe maybe we should just come back from break now. Yeah, uh, let's Brendan. Come back. Okay. Brendan? Yeah, we might have lost Brendan. I'm going to try to stop his share. Oh. Oh no! Is my mic level go. is my mic level better now? Uh, maybe a little bit lower uh, yet, Jamie. <laughs> I was How wondering. Now? Like, you know, the, the first thing when that music dropped out, I was like, "Did did we lose Brendan or did we lose me?" Like, yeah, exactly. Sure. I had the exact same thought, and then I saw your reaction. <laughs> I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> uh, let me read some IMs because um, this one this one made me laugh out loud during the break. Uh, this is from Assy McGee which is the uh, name of a character I played on a uh, cartoon or, or I played, it was a cartoon that I did a character. I can't remember. Um, Sammy, my straight gay crush, you give me W-A-A, wet ass ass. So thank you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's nice. Sorry. WAP is a state of mind. It has no gender. Maybe a defining interview of uh, the Trump era for the majority report in the first uh, <laughs> I am is about that exactly good stuff. Wait, what happened to this music brendan did you go away i don't know what happened i just put my headphones back and it must have cut out i'm sorry okay. everyone that's okay um let's see uh foreign agent after multiple recommendations from mr crew members i finally got around to reading democracy and change last week and now i want to add my own endorsement extremely well researched gives great insight to how republicans have been propagandized to vote against their own interests because of their fear racial equality more than they fear economic inequality Go back and listen to the interview that we did um, uh, with her, uh, Nancy McLean. Is that her name? So, so who wrote it? Yep. Democracy um, and Chains. Yep. Yeah. There was also um, there was some controversy about some of the academic, right? The yeah. The I actually uh, I I go into some of that in a literary hangover episode, uh, early one on democracy and chains. I get into some of that. I mean, there's certain things, but a lot of it, it really kind of amounts to it's picky. Yeah, it it is. I think it's a little bit. I think it's a little bit picky. And like caveat, we're only talking about working class Republicans when we talk about this because most Republicans are not poor. Uh, my mom is a re Republican. She's not going to vote for Biden, says Amy Jean. She'll abstain on the presidential and vote down ballot Republican. I, right after the DNC, I don't know, Wednesday maybe, um, I was talking to a guy whose dad, I think, was from Tennessee. And he goes, the whole Kasich thing worked with my dad. He's going to vote for Biden now. And I was like, all right. Let's see in three months if that, if that holds up. 
I have a feeling that's going to. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, I don't know that many Republicans, but I have kind of a good case study in terms of my friend's parents when I go visit them in rural Rhode Island. And her dad's like full on MAGA chud, watches Fox News every day, believes conspiracy theories, big Trump guy. Her mom was like, oh, I don't like the way that he talks about women and immigrants like I really I, re I really don't like that you know like she's very much against any kind of interpersonal racism but at the end of the day she voted for Trump because she's a Republican right it's pretty simple right yeah that's just because they're uncomfortable defending it in certain social situations new human says I looked up the wiki peaks uh wikipedia oh shoot this is one of the problems with this thing I looked up the Wikipedia article on self-deportation. Besides Stevens being full of it, it attributes its first notable usage, albeit in a non-political context, to Roman Polanski. Total majority report of bingo there. Um, <laughs> it was used, well, no, this is it. This is more relevant. I'm looking at this now on Wikipedia. In 1994, William Safai described its usage by California Governor Pete Wilson's immigration strategy. So a Republican governor in California in 1994 was using it. In Proposition 187, which we talked about with Jean, Jean uh, uh, Guerrero, um, which was that anti-immigrant bill, prevented illegal aliens from using a variety of state social services. Sapphire summarized the philosophy of the approach as holding that the most cost-effective cost way to change behavior is to make it life unbearable under present behavior. So, uh, boom, I guess I probably should have looked that up. But yeah. so not about making things better where they come from. Yeah, no. Right. But Did but but even if you even if you throw that, look, even if you want to say, well, it's a, it's a stick and a carrot. A stick is a little bit easier for uh, for Republicans to get to. Yeah. Um, Dan Denver wrote a lot about this in his book, too. Otto Matlek on July 28th, 2015. Right. I remember you told the story about how you'd hired a babysitter who just didn't show up one day, disappeared, tried to get in contact with her. And he even said you would call the cops and she just ignored and ghosted you. She eventually uh, texted back to Nikki saying, leave my family out of this. Was there any resolution to that story? Do you have any other crazy babysitting stories? Also, what's wrong with Destiny? He keeps defending the Kenosha shooter. I, I have no idea uh, about uh, Destiny in that regard. Uh, those are two very disparate topics. Uh, that's me and my babysitter <laughs> stories. Um, no, that was the end of it. I never heard from that babysitter again. And um, I do have one other crazy babysitting story, but it preceded that. And, and actually, you saw the front end of it. I can't remember the show was, but it was in 20. It must have been in 2013. Somewhere around like. No, wait a second. Saul was born. It was in it was in probably the beginning of 2014. Maybe or 2013. Yeah. Beginning of 2014, mid mid 2014, when Saul got locked in the uh, our apartment, babysitter went down to go do the laundry. She locked him in the apartment. And uh, the fire department had to bust open the door. And she had left a pot of cooking pasta on the stove oh geez yeah you got to go and zip recruiter find some better babysitters i don't know I, I don't i don't know if i told the story but i was uh i was investigated by social services for for a while wow they have to they're mandatory reporting in that situation uh. um and and w which you know was was fine i mean it wasn't fun and it wasn't they weren't you know th they came and they did some interviews and stuff like that and I was like, I understand because, you know, you don't know. You don't know. I blame Destiny in both situations. Yeah. Uh, Destiny should not have locked my kid in. And Saul slept through the whole thing, incidentally. He was in the, his crib. Uh, Stuart Stevens uh, says, Chaddy Stevens ooh, is pretty much the quintessential name for a never Trumper, Romney strategist. Uh, Jeffro, sorry, but the interview today was a complete waste. You're not going to get anything out of those people. That is very, uh, I appreciate that, Jeff Rowe. Thank you <laughs> for that uh, note. I, frankly, um, I don't know. I would be curious to hear from someone who was not as skeptical about uh, the Lincoln Project 
and see if it was a complete waste. But I, I was very explicit with what my agenda was there, which was to sort of say the Lincoln Project is dubious. Hmm. Yeah, if you talk to Cliff lately, maybe get his opinion. <laughs> I have not, but that was, yeah, no. Um, maybe that was, maybe that was a sock puppet. Uh, thoughts <laughs> about the People's Convention last weekend. I got to be honest with you. It says uh, WebZet to kick. I did not check it out. Um, uh, I'm interested when Cornell West speaks, but there's plenty of opportunity to see him speak. Uh, same with Nina Turner. And then the other um, highlighted speaker I saw, there were three, Cornell West, Nina Turner, and Jimmy Dore. And I got to be honest with you, when I see the Jimmy Dore as promoted as the one of the top speakers, it occurs to me that maybe this is not um, a well thought out thing. So. Yeah, fair enough. But I mean, look, you know, in terms of the third party thing, there's going to be an attempt to take over the Democratic Party by the AOC wing. I happen to think that it's going to win for the same reasons why Stuart Stevens was basically saying, like, you know, um, he, he thinks I'm younger than I am, probably. I'm probably significantly closer in age to him than I am to Jamie. Um, but can, we can confirm that. All right, take it easy, Brendan. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I think, like, you know, a, a a third party that was building like support in local races, even like you know, like yeah. Well, you see it with the Justin Justice Democrats and the mm -hmm. the efficacy of that, right? They're going in, and and maybe it makes more sense to do this in the context of primaries. It's certainly cheaper, but I could imagine that there are races like. I don't know, let's say that race in Massachusetts, okay, that if there was a decent third party could come in and in low dollar situations where like, you know, you got eight people in a race, they're all splitting their votes, you could come in maybe and pick up something here or there. Having 10 members of a block in the Democratic uh, caucus, essentially, even if it's your third party, right? You get a caucus with somebody. Um, that could be very powerful. Having a senator or two in a caucus, like, it could be very powerful. Um, and then you're also building an infrastructure for something that, in the event that history goes in a certain direction, uh, you're there to, to, to pick up the pieces. But, you know... Uh, I, I, um, but it has to be done by, by, by smart, smart. Yeah. People. I would like political parties should win elections, not, you know, get 5% yeah. in them. Yeah. No, the green party let in a few too many idiots along the way. I don't think there's any coming back from that, but, um, in terms of what a third party should be doing, when I talk about a workers party, I'm not just talking about a party along the model of the Democrats and the Republicans. I'm talking about a working class organization right. that does a whole bunch of different things and builds like a militant working class base that is capable of challenging the power of capital. Now, this party might run candidates in elections strategically. Um, the DSA is not a party, but, you know, we engage with elections where we think that they're strategic. But um, the you got to build it from the ground up before you can even do that. And you certainly can't start with a uh, president. It's 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 as much modeled on a union uh, in some respects as as it is a political party in the way that we know them in this country. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's get to uh, obviously for a lot of folks, not for everybody. We have a broad spectrum of people of many ages and uh, many of our listeners and viewers. I think probably the majority uh, don't have kids. I don't know. It's probably half and half, I would say. So a lot of people are thinking about teachers right now and um, remote learning. Like I say, I, 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 I personally would have liked to have seen a situation where elementary school kids go full time high school kids, middle uh, school kids, fully remote, obviously kids with special needs who might have a more difficult time uh, learning remotely, go full time in the schools. You use those extra schools, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, uh, if I'm ever a mayor or governor uh, or president during the next pandemic, then that's what we'll get. But um, but yes, there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, teaching and education. And the key is, is like, how do you, one of the hard parts about remote is like, how do you have this relationship between a teacher and a student? Because the education, according to educators that I've talked to anyways, is all about the dynamic between the teacher and the student. And if the student has a problem with this, the teacher teaches in a different way than they would with a different student who has a problem with that. It's a slight oversimplification. There's a reason you have to have a master's degree to be a teacher. Yeah, and it's not just a question of knowledge. It's a question of like, the ability, it's almost like playing, you know, uh, you know, pick up basketball. Like you got to read the situation and your training, you deploy, but you deploy your training in different ways in different contexts. Greg Gutfield doesn't see it that way. Here he is on Fox, uh, the five, laying it out like, well, this is easy. I think um, uh, there's an opportunity here that is huge. Here's the big picture. Think about how nuts this is. Before the, even before the pandemic, there are probably 130,000 teachers teaching the same algebra class, 130,000 of the same class every day. We do the five <clears throat> once a day at 5 p.m. for three and a half million people. What's nuts and what makes sense? We don't have 130,000 panels going around doing the exact same show wherever. We don't, we don't need this model anymore. It's not working. That's what Emily's talking about. It is revealing the corruption of this model. We could actually fundamentally change education right now using the pandemic. Treat it the way we don't, you, you don't make a million movies. You make one movie and you show it to a million people. We need to break mm -hmm. the teachers unions and embrace this innovation of remote learning and get it, we could actually free the minds of a generation i say it again and again the first yeah. person to figure this out is going to be not a billionaire but a trillionaire peloton did to the gym what we can do to brick and mortar schools the person who gets there first it, it's going to be bigger than me uh to his point uh greg guffield's only like five foot five so the the level of ignorance that that he, that he was able to capture there and to deliver with such passion i think is um is is genuinely impressive the idea that like no one's had the idea that wait we could just have one person do a lecture and then everybody could learn from it as if like that's what learning about geometry is like first off this is how you know like first uh, I don't know if Greg Gutfield has kids, but if he does, I can guarantee you he sends them to a private school just because uh, why wouldn't he, right? Why wouldn't he? It, it, ideologically, he obviously has this problem with all the teachers union in schools. Now, why would you do that? Why would you even have private schools? If there is no difference, why not just record one private school teacher and just play the video the whole time because it's not effective you moron. That's not what education is. There's a difference between watching a movie and learning an academic subject. Yes, you could go in and listen to lecture. You could have a lecture series and you can learn things from a lecture series. Generally, you want to be a little bit older because, um, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, young kids have tough time with lectures for an hour or and then go to the next lecture for an hour et cetera, et cetera. Maybe he has no children. I don't understand. I don't understand this level of ignorance because I think it's genuine. I think it's a genuine no. show of ignorance. He was so passionate about it that he couldn't have just been saying it and thinking like, because that's hard to do. That's hard to be that stupid and know that you're just pretending. Well, not, this right? is Fox I mean, News we're talking about. I know it. I know it. I think there are people who do that, but I, 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 I'm giving him enough credit that it would be too hard for him to say something that dumb and know how stupid it was. I just think he's stupid. Mm. Hey, give me him credit. I guess it doesn't matter that much at the end of the day, right? The old, the old argument, are, you, are they stupid? Are they evil? The outcome's the same, folks. Also- They're not mutually exclusive. Right. right. 
people are making money off of privatizing education hand over foot. It's the process that's been going on for a very long time, and it does not have good outcomes for the children. Um, absolutely. I mean, all you need to do is do, I mean, like the idea that, you know, maybe you can watch like a five minute video with a kid, you know, first and second grader where, you know, where the teacher's reading a book. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sorry, the, the, that is not, it doesn't have anything to do with learning. It really doesn't. Yeah. Like, like you remember when your teacher didn't feel like teaching class one day and just like put on a video right. for you to watch. Well, it would I mean, be like that. Those days. It would be like that every day. It sounds pretty good, actually. Well, I get a. It, I, it I, does. I, in it, my situation, they had to wheel in a 16 millimeter projector. So it wasn't such a that that was not an option. <laughs> Yeah, it does suck that the only way America can respond, the only people set up to respond to crises in America are the most grasping people um, with money. Basically. Yeah, no, this is disaster capitalism through and through. You know, what? oh, I have an idea. Like it, for people who don't have, um, uh, you know, video or computer or high internet, you know, high speed internet, you could actually take the lecture um, and have somebody write it down. And then like figure out some device in which you could put it on paper and show it to people. And that's maybe the way a, people can learn. Maybe a phonograph. Un, un, unbelievable. Um, all right. Uh, let's go uh, to the phones. Calling from a 954 area code. Oh, there we, I just turned it on. That's why there's so few people. 954. Tammy, it's Michael in Miami. How are you? Michael in Miami. How are you, sir? <sighs> Sweating like the rest of us down here. <laughs> Wait, listen, uh, okay, I'm going to probably fall in the, major in, in the minority, the distinct minority here. I enjoyed the interview with Stevens. Uh, he is a pro. I don't think he may have understood who you were and your background. His publicist probably just set it up. So he, he may have thought it was just another MSNBC kind of left the center thing that's going to sit there and Oh, I dropped again. Shoot. Well, on one second, Mike. And the, <sighs> it was an MSNBC thing that oh. was just going to sit there. I got his mark. All right, Mike, Michael, Mike, Mike, Mike from Miami. I apologize. You were talking and I dropped off the line. So you said he, oh. th his publicist told him it was probably just another one of those MSNBC type of things. Right. He wasn't prepared for you. He was not prepared for, for what you were offering, nor did he know your background, I think, probably to the extent he should have. So that when he, you approached him with your line of questioning, he wasn't going to be, he was probably taken aback a little bit. But he, like you said before, he's a pro. He's handled this stuff before. He's not an idiot. And, and in a grudging sense, I know this is going to give me a lot of hate. I, I, actually, I actually like what he had to say in terms of how he responded from a, a circular standpoint, from a global standpoint. Not from a specifics. From a specifics, you know, obviously he still harbors same of the same, some of the same positions. And I think the one question I would have asked him, and maybe you asked him, I didn't hear it. Where do you differ in substance from where the Trump administration is on taxes, on regulation, on foreign intervention? Where do you substantively differ? Even if it was a Lincoln Project member. And the answer is they don't. Uh, they hate his style. The, they despise the I, fact that he's, he's he's a buffoon, but they don't differ one iota. No, the from, only from thing that, I, and you're right. I should I I, I meant to get to that. Did, I thought did you was, ask. I, I apologize if you asked. Well, me. I didn't hear. You know that. what? I, when I asked him about when he talked about principles, I think I had in my notes. I was anticipating he would say fiscal responsibility, and that would have brought it up because these guys feel like the tax cuts are not the problem. The problem was that they didn't cut uh, cut services. Um, right. and, and yes, well, I should have gone there, but you know what he wants, he's, he says he's happy to come back. So. No, I Apparently. think I look, I think it was a respectful interview. And I was trying to say it before you never get him to confess on the stand. It just doesn't work that way. Right. All you can do is make your statements in a cross-examination way and see what he, how he reacts and try to, you know, to the totality of the circumstances, put together some type of, of argument. But I thought for the most part, I thought it was I thought it was illuminating. Now I know a lot of people who listen to your show are going to just like flat out say 
waste of time, charlatan, total thorough fraud. Well, take it thing. easy, uh, Michael. I don't think that's the case. I, well, I'm, I, I, I the I'm message, an ultra leftist, and I enjoyed it very yeah, much. Jamie liked it. Jamie yeah, it was an all-time well, interview. Well, that's, that's, that says a lot, and that says a lot for your maturity, Jamie. So congratulations, because oh. a lot of people wouldn't have. <laughs> See, the good thing Sam and I yep. have, and since I'm older than Sam, the, the history and the perspective with knowing what's going on, and so he could pull them to show the county fair you know, piece out there, even though it was in August of 1980, and those civil rights workers were slaughtered in August of 64. That was an important piece of historical relevance. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand that the Republican Party now stands for the same thing that they did 40 years ago. They just have a different model. And, and you can draw a straight effing line from the Nixon, Roger Stone, you know, uh, Donald Segretti stuff and, the, you know, political dirty tricks right through Lee Atwater, right through Karl Rove, right through, through Brooks Stone. Brothers riot. Yeah. Roger Stone was there. Indeed. Yeah. 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 Donald Segretti. I mean, Matt knows this. He does a lot of historical stuff. You know, the, the USC mafia stories with him and Dwight Chapin, you understand all that stuff. That's where that shit's never changed. Nope. They've never gone away. They've all, it's almost as if they bequeathed their ignorance to the succeeding generation, or, or I should say prejudice. And as far as. You I'll know, tell you something, the, you uh, the mic on that part, on that point, I remember Gore Vidal coming in uh, to studio with Janine and I back in the day. And I think he had a book called the Amer- United States of amnesia. And he would talk about this and I couldn't, the funny thing is that I couldn't, uh, I, I didn't really fully understand. I didn't fully, I mean, I understood what he was talking about from an intellectual sense, but I didn't fully appreciate it. But now that I've been doing this for 15 years, where it's like 15 years, that's not that long ago. And you're like, this was such a big deal 15 years ago. And the idea that it is completely not there's no institutional memory within the media within our government None. within None. any of this stuff and i i and and jamie and matt and brendan you guys are going to experience this too 15 years from now <laughs> when it's like who would ever think that uh you know oh, and they're gonna you know say something that donald trump would do every day and that would never <laughs> happen and you guys are gonna pull, pull your hair out it's true. I used to, I love Michael to death and I miss him a lot, but I, and the things we would disagree upon and I would call in it and, and you know, I'd actually get hung up on, I'd say, you don't understand. You're making positions and points and arguments without the breadth of history and the culture and the knowledge of what was going on prior to that. There's a reason why Reagan won 49 states in 84. There's a reason why Nixon won 70 in 72 with a 49 state landslide. You can't ignore that stuff or else you're walking to the same buzzsaw. They're using the same arguments. And I saw this as a political reporter across the country. The same arguments were used in Michigan. They were used in Virginia. They were used in Florida. They're the same things because it's generally the same consultants were giving the same talking points. And once it works at one level, it's going to get transferred I, to another. I will but tell you, that is why it, it, it's frustrating. It, I would tell everyone to read every single one of those four uh, Rick Perlstein books. If you have, I don't know how many months it would take you. I mean, it's, well, it's Nixon good. land, Nixon land. I'm still working through, Yeah, but it's, it's a great piece of scholarship and it is helpful, but it's nothing like, and you know, it's funny. You tell these guys that and they're going to laugh at you, but in 15 years, you guys, I promise you, you'll have the same perspective that Sam just looked at and you go, I, Hey man, we, at, we heard about this. At my retirement, at my retirement yeah, party, at my re- retirement party, you guys can remember this and bring it up. In and, the Senate. And, and then, <laughs> Maybe by that time, uh, Michael, I will get my Florida grapefruits. You know, not my California just, okay, grapefruits. You got it. Okay, give me, give me this. What? We are in the middle of an international pandemic, and I'm going to drive by the Griffin Road Citrus Deposit, and I'm going to make sure that I send you guys your packages of grapefruits from the state of Florida with Ron DeSantis's approval. I know you'll think that part. No, I can't do it now because we're not. Uh, I, I, they're, they're all going to go back. Uh, yeah, but no, but uh, eventually. Um, you're, uh, by the way, the person, the personal response, I'll let this go on this, the personal responsibility stuff, you know what that's from, right? You know what that's, that's all about. If you, it goes back to the late sixties and the one hand, queen. it's, yeah, it's yeah. lazy, lazy people of color who don't want to work, yeah. who aren't going to take responsibility. It's the same nonsense. They have 30 kids out of wedlock and I got to pay for their, t- I mean, the crap I heard growing up in, in that, in that cycle, it's the same thing. It's been repackaged. It's the same argument. Appreciate the call, Mike. Bye-bye.
Take care, guys. Wow. Um, he's really generous with the compliments today. I feel yeah. like I'm doing something right now. I also You're think really he over... Sure about that. He also, yeah, I might exaggerate the anti-intellectual element of this show a tiny bit, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we're pro-reading books here. Well, my, Michael loves that to let us know that each time he calls. <laughs> the his, a historical qualities, yeah. We are um, anti-math, but pro-reading. And I will say, I'm going to be at least as cranky as you are, Sam, if I get to be your age and none of this shit's changed. Oh, Tell me about it. I'm going to be writing Ted Kaczynski at that point, I think. <laughs> um. I don't know if it's really going to impact my politics in the way that he thinks it is, but uh, we'll see. Let's play this. Yesterday, we played this clip of Donald Trump telling Laura Ingram about um, the uh, some type of plot where there was like seven guys who got on a plane dressed in black and they had all sorts of gear and he couldn't tell any other things. And that piqued the interest of some reporters. Here is a Donald Trump at, um, where is he, at uh, Joint Base Andrews. He's asked a question by a reporter about this plot. And he's like, oh. Now, wait, where was it that he read this? It was in some freaking, some, like, who knows. But here. There, there was a viral uh, Facebook message that went around oh, in July. Was. And he's get, just getting to it now. In July. Do you have it's a picture got briefed. of that? Do you have a picture of that? Let's yeah, one get, second. Get, get that picture. And let's play this clip and then get that picture. Um, in July, incidentally, when they uh, when this was going down. But uh, here is uh, here is Donald Trump. Uh, he's gonna get. He'll 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 set the reporter up. Tell us more about this plot that you were referring to on Fox News last the night. Which? This plot of people gathering on a plane uh, in here. Yeah, I could tell you that uh, I could probably refer you to the person and they could do it. I'd like to ask that person if it was okay, but a person who was on a plane uh, said that there were about six people like that person, more or less. And uh, what happened is the entire plane filled up with the looters, the anarchists, the rioters, people that obviously were looking for trouble. And the person felt very uncomfortable in the plane. This would be a person you know. So I will see whether or not I can get that person. I'll let them know, and I'll see whether or not I can get that person to speak to you. But this was a first-hand account of a plane going from Washington to wherever. And I'll see if I can get that information for you. Maybe they'll speak to you. Maybe they won't. So wait a second. Now, now when he was telling this to Ingram, I thought that he had gotten some type of, he made it sound like, you know, with the Department of Homeland Security, we had counterintelligence, counterterrorism officials. We pulled these people off the plane. But no, it turns out just somebody he knows who's a big deal, maybe one of his cabinet secretaries was flying somewhere and saw seven people on a plane that looked suspicious. Hmm. I wonder what it was about them that uh, aroused their suspicions. Wearing black clothes. Maybe it was also the color of their skin. I don't know. I have to ask the other person if they'll talk about it. Yeah. So this is not even a law enforcement issue. He's just talking about somebody told him a story of seven people who were on a plane all wearing the same uniform. Probably, for all we know, it could have been some, like, you know, Frisbee golf uh, team. Yeah, I guess you never heard of eyewitness testimony, Sam. I mean, oh, my it's, God. Uh, it's extra it ridiculous because everyone knows that uh, Antifa... We have our own plans. Wait a second. Wait a second. Russ Thor Wade. Yeah. Who's Russ Thor Wade? Who's <laughs> for, that guy? You don't know who Russ Thor Wade is? He's, Boise he's an and intel surrounding guy. areas. Be ready for attacks downtown to residential areas. At least a dozen males got off the plane in Boise from Seattle. Bingo. So was he talking Washington, D.C.? Or maybe he was talking Seattle, Washington. With the Seattle, guys. Washington. Yeah. Dressed head to toe in black. Backpacks only. One had a tattoo that said Antifa America on his <laughs> <laughs> that's there, a troll there are people there are people watching and will keep us informed heads on a swivel watch your six and carry heavy oh my god <laughs> if you want to share this and make fun of it go ahead and show your children childish attitudes oh um, that, that is like that is 20 like, that might be a joke do people, actually do people remember where leftist best is from where that comes from it it was graffiti 
from a uh, place in Connecticut, I think. After- in my hometown, West Hartford. In West I Hartford. used to play on that playground. Oh, suspicious, actually. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I've what? said too much. <laughs> and okay. there was graffiti there that was supposedly done by anti-Trump forces that just wrote, left is best. Now, so, now when we say it, it sounds like graffiti that somebody would write because it's actually, but, but, but like it's a thing now. Rule. we've turned it into a thing, but that's, that to me has that same sort of resonance. Antifa America on there. So Russ Thor Wade is a Patriot prayer guy. And here he is oh, leading God. prayer at Patriot's day, 2019. Okay, so I joke in a different way. Um, and not for nothing, but they're all wearing black shirts in that video. <laughs> Did you see it? Put that video back up. Don't, don't, don't play. Just to freeze it where you had it. Black shirts. Who and are these I guys? imagine They're right one, in front two, of him. Three, four. There's one behind him. And I wonder what they were wearing on their backs to carry in that audio equipment. Was it backpacks? Russ, the call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> oh, my God. God, it's so insane. So insane. Yeah, no, we got our own planes, folks. We're not, uh, we're not flying commercial at this point. That's right. Antifa America, that's the name of the airline, isn't it? (laughs) I mean, yeah. And like, you have that much Soros money, you know, you're going to, you're going to get something uh, a little bit nicer than the average uh, agitator. You know, (laughs) some, some of them drop the milkshakes right on to people. It's George Soros calling. I just want you to know there's going to be a little something extra in your envelope this month. <laughs> so <laughs> buy a new backpack. Can we just talk about Antifa America? So apparently the Antifa HQ got together and said, we're going to really lean into the patriotism side of this. I mean, That's I'm right. glad they got over that divide on the left, whether you can embrace mm-hmm. patriotism. Uh, hi, Jamie. It's uh, it's George Soros again. I just wanted to uh, hope you're enjoying your new backpacks. Um, but um, uh, <laughs> I am also selling a Antifa America <laughs> tattoo kit and was hoping that maybe a couple of you would put it on there. Maybe we could make something out of this, make it a little bit of a trend. Yeah, you know what? Let me talk to my people in uh, HR, and we'll see if we can make it part of our team building exercise next week. Um, we missed this one the other day with Laura Ingram and uh, Donald Trump on Fox News. Uh, no, this was part two. It was a two-part two oh, night interview series. Yeah. Oh, oh, smart, smart, smart. Welcome uh, it. You can't, was, uh, can't really digest it in one Donald scene. Trump. All he needs to do is re- Rerun 2016 because, um, because well, he won the popular vote last time. Do you think you can win the popular vote? It's more than 2016. The popular vote. uh, People say it's important for you to win it, not because you wouldn't be president, but because it sends a message to the country, and that itself calms down. So conservatives or Republicans in blue states that that would kind of be like, oh, it doesn't matter if I vote. What do you tell them tonight? I think I could win. I think I did win the popular vote in a true sense. I think there was tremendous cheating in California. There was tremendous cheating in New York and other places. And if you take a look at the Libertarian, you know, they always talk about Jill Stein. Jill Stein took, what, half a percent. They talk about Jill Stein. Well, I have a Libertarian. I'm somewhat Libertarian. I have to be honest with you. Rand Paul will tell you that. Uh, I have a libertarian candidate on last time that got, what, four and a half or so percent. Those are all Republican voters. They're wasting their vote because they have to vote for us. But this time. (laughs) I got more of the popular vote because of cheating and then other things that I didn't get the vote. Gary Johnson. I love that he's so self-centered that even he resents Jill Stein. It's like, I didn't win because of Jill Stein. I won because I won. I thought we went bigger if I wanted to. Jill Stein wasn't a fact. She didn't, she's not the one who took the votes. The Gary Johnson took all the votes. I won. I mean, more or less, based upon the math. It's very, I won it. I won it. Uh, it is, it is sort of fascinating the the idea that that I mean, when you hear Stuart Stevens uh talk about remind us that Donald Trump won with less votes than Mitt Romney lost with. Um you got to get those people off the sidelines and hopefully uh, Donald Trump's uh, horridness will drive them there. Or maybe Joe Biden's nice guyness. Mm. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I will say it doesn't bode super well for democracy that the uh, 
popular vote and the electoral college have a widening gap between them. Uh, it is, uh, it is bad news, man. Call him from uh, 818 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. It's Dave from Jamaica. Are Dave from Jamaica. What's on your mind, Dave? Um, well, I found that interview very enlightening and well, kind of well, um, thank you. highlighted some suspicions, at least what I think the Lincoln Project type folks think is going to happen because I, as you listen to the interview, you kind of let certain things slip unconsciously, like their designs to kind of turn the Democratic Party into like the new less racist Republican Party. What? I, <laughs> I think you might be right mm. about that. Yep. Yeah, but I think it also shows a bit of delusion too because think they underestimate the kind of the white identity politics that Trump has kind of activated in certain voters as well. So, because I, I, it, I see a lot of delusion in it, like the whole, um, they're going to basically force out the AOCs into a third party, basically. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure if they're playing with a full deck. What's your take on it? I, I, I think there you're you're, mm -hmm. you're correct in saying there are two different things. There is their perception of what they can achieve in this instance, mm -hmm. and there is the reality of what they can achieve, even if that is their plan. And 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 you know he said it was he said it was uh you know looking at cholesterol uh in in the middle of a knife fight. I mean I'm I I I, I disagree with that uh, metaphor, but that is the metaphor he used. Um, I think it's actually uh, looking at a knife fight and then saying, okay, and then what do I do with the guys who are running down who aren't here yet that I'm fighting, but are running down the street mm -hmm. towards me. I think it's that also is a little bit right. of awareness, but, um, but putting that aside, I think you're right insofar as um, there's just not enough of those Lincoln project people to form that center right party that they're talking about. And I think you know, without knowing, you know, it's, well, let me put it this way. Steve Schmidt gave up the game, right? That's what he wanted to do with Howard Schultz. That's what Howard right. Schultz was. And I, and, and if you go back and look at that interview, when I said it was about the cash, Stuart just, you know, did one of these. He had no, he just pretended like he didn't hear me say that all well and good. It was about the cash for Steve Schmidt. But it also was consistent, I think, with where he would like to be. If, you know, that if if they could have Michael. God damn it. Sorry. Uh, if they could have uh, Michael Bloomberg run for president, uh, they would. Sorry, I lost you, Dave. If they could have Michael I'm Bloomberg. Back, I'm back. I'm back. Uh, I'm, I think I'm yeah. back. Yeah. Uh, if they could run for uh, if they could run Michael Bloomberg for president, they'd be very happy with that. I think on some level, guys like Steve Schmidt and, and Stuart Stevens. But the fact of the matter is, is that I think to the extent that there's anything dynamic happening in the Democratic Party, it is not a growing sense that we need a center. Center party that that is. Well. That Depends is, who you ask, right? I don't know if I can do phone calls today, folks. There is something fundamentally wrong with uh, what's going on here with my phone uh, device. I cannot call in and stay on the line. Uh, sorry, Dave. Well, I'm going to have to let you go. Dave. I'm back again. I know. No, it's, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's my on. I got to let you go because I keep dropping the calls for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. No problem. All right. Bye bye. Um, I don't know what that's uh, about, um, but I think, you know, and look, we don't know. I, I, I predicted that the Republican Party would be in the wilderness for years and they weren't uh, back in 2006 or 2008. And um, I thought that I, I thought they would be. But, uh, you know, the, the Democratic Party gave them life again by basically taking half measures. Um, it wasn't and maybe half measures is even the wrong way of articulating it. Um, what they did was take half measures. I think in their agenda, it was a full measure, uh, at least in terms of, you know, what uh, Obama's plans were. Um, 
But I think maybe we're five, maybe we're 10, maybe we're 15 years out. Maybe we are, there's going to be more, maybe there's a Tom Cotton administration in between this, but I think ultimately, um, yeah, ultimately, um, uh, I think you're going to see the trend in the democratic party, like it's been for the past couple of years, which is to the left. It's not to say that it's left now saying the trend. Mm. Um, That's very optimistic of you. Well, I think the trend is that way. I mean, if you look at like, you look at like what the blue dog, um, you know, a democratic caucus is, it's smaller. If you look at like the corporatist democratic caucus in the house, it's smaller than it was. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's not dominant or it doesn't control the leadership. Yeah, I think that's the way it is. Like, will this tug from below impact the leadership at some point? Well, I think yeah, like what is their ability to resist this thing? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been pretty good so far for them. So, well, but I and, think... and it's not like no uh, tiny minority has ever ruled over an oppressed majority for hundreds of years. <laughs> well, I I yeah. no, I totally agree with all that. But I but I would say, in terms of like you know to 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 be like Michael in Miami. From a historical standpoint, we are light years away from where we were just even 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think the kind of realignment that you guys are talking about, uh, especially hearkening back to the New Deal and the Great Society, it can't happen without the attendant social forces on the ground and I, the amount of people creating chaos and trouble for the ruling class. And I don't think that we have that yet right now. Well. I, but I'm, I'm not I, I'm not predicting a um, a new deal era. I mean, I, I think there's going yeah. to be I think there's going to be some incrementalism here. But, you know, even Stuart Stevens thinks that, you know, within 15 years, we're going to have Medicare for all of some form. Uh, and and um, I think that is the the I think that is the case. It may not be um sufficient but it is in terms of a trend that's all i'm talking about i mean it, it, like when nancy pelosi was one last time in 20, 2006 i can tell you it was a very different uh you know perspective there was no there was no aocs there was no yeah uh, there's no squad squadron. when there there's was no, no squad when we negotiated obamacare obamacare y- yes yeah. it's also a, a painfully slow process but you know what every literally everything every route that all of us have been talking about is a slow process that takes many years. And I just, I worry that when the shit hits the fan 10 years from now, and we really descend into fascism and horror, the squad might be like 20 people, but it's certainly very, worth a shot. Very possible. Very possible. It's good to have uh, contingencies. Call from an 847 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Okay. So my name is Nico. I've called in before. I actually spoke to Jamie and Matt a couple weeks ago. I don't know if they remember. (laughs) I was the guy who called um, about my mom going back to school. Okay. Um, But anyways, um, (laughs) um, what I wanted to talk about was Matt's tweet. And I know I'm going to start drama, but okay. So Matt tweeted about (laughs) Sagar and um Rising is something I've actually wanted to talk to you about, Sam, because it's such a weird show because I genuinely like Crystal, but Sagar is just, I mean, I'm sorry to say it, like, I'm 19, so I guess maybe, like, anyone can say, like, I'm immature, but I think Sagar's a fascist, like, straight up, like, he called for the military to quell protests, um, he's anti-weed, like, I saw one of his tweets and he said, oh, one of the Rising viewers, um, was smoking weed and I was so disturbed by it. Like, I just, I don't know. Like, I feel like the show is just primed to not vote for Biden. I mean, I think there is an anti-establishmentarian um, uh, attitude that can be confused with um, a leftist politics. Sometimes it aligns, sometimes it doesn't align. And, um, and if the, you know, if the agenda is to move to the left, um, then, you know, uh, then you get a different presentation than you get there. I mean, there's a whole different dynamic, right? I mean, like she's, it's not, it's not, it's not Crystal's show. She's gets, she, 
it's news world communications yeah, I mean, the it's, hills. it's yeah, it, and she has to sit there and not say anything when he's repeating fascist lies and propaganda. I mean, right, right. In every context, like, I mean, I talked about this just in the terms of like you know uh, filling in for Hayes, and you know, with all due respect, you know, uh, Barbara Boxer, very nice person, I'm sure, uh, just not my first choice for a guest. But that's, you know, that's who was available. That's the context. And I'm not going to throw a hissy fit about it. You trade off some things for platform and you make a, you make an assessment. I mean, every, everybody who does anything like this does that. You make a decision between like, what am I doing that is going to, you know, enhance my reach and what do I not do, um, you know, uh, or do do to do that. A lot of dues uh, to do that, um, and you know, at what point am I crossing a threshold of undermining my my integrity or undermining my brand or whatever? To, you know, however different people look at it, and yeah. or um, giving something to the far right that maybe you didn't need to, right? And um, and so I, I mean, I think you know, people, I I. I I don't watch it that much. Somebody sent me a clip of uh, the postal stuff. And I think that showed like, you know, that was a good example of just sort of, I don't know, of something that I thought was disingenuous and it was probably a little bit clickbait and sometimes just contrarian. Uh, but um, yeah, it, I, it's also a good example of how right. Sagar was created in a lab to be the most palatable reactionary possible. Yeah, exactly. Right? Cause he wasn't foaming at the mouth when he said that stuff. And if you didn't know that much about it and you weren't really listening, you'd think yeah. he was being reasonable. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say like, that's true. Like if Sagar was actually like a working class populist, he would have supported Bernie Sanders. But I feel like, um, and I'm sorry, Sam, but I don't know how you did that interview, man. Like YouTube chat was was molding like <laughs> many. Oh, did I just get hung up and on again? Oh, no. Yes, I did. Son of a. <sighs> but to respond to his last point, this is literally Sam's favorite thing. So uh, don't Wait, don't sorry. worry about him. Uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I missed what you said. What happened on the YouTube chat? People were 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 what? <laughs> oh, oh, people people were malding. It's a term like you're mad and like you're balding. But people were like, people were <laughs> upset that this guy. Wow, that's a new one. Like, like oh, like George Bush was a compassionate Republican. Like two hundred thousand Iraqis at minimum. Well, like, he said. I'm pretty sure he, he if said, you asked them, they wouldn't say that. You know. He, he said. He said uh, the Iraq was a disaster. Yeah. No. Of course, he doesn't spend any time on that. And I, and I suppose I could have gotten into an argument about that with him. But it's like uh, everybody on this program knows what you know that he's he's glossing over that. And you know, you could overlook I that. You for doing that interview. I wouldn't have been able to do that. I mean, I just, I probably would have lost my mind, but I commend you for doing that. Like, <laughs> no, well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for the call. For sure. Thank you. Bye. Um, it was interesting. I mean, it was, in, it's also interesting to talk to a guy who's like so deep into strategy and can just look at those numbers and break that down. Um, Yes, and he really does love uh, love Mitt Romney. That's that's for sure. <laughs> um, here is uh, <laughs> uh, the he and I will say this: the next sixty days, and I would argue actually more than the next sixty days, uh, because I don't think the election is going to be over on that day. I I I think there is a significant chance that we're going to have some iteration of what we had in two thousand. Well, uh, it'll be over if Trump wins. It, what do you mean? It, the the election? Yeah. Like if, if, Trump wins wins it out, if Trump wins it outright, you think the Democrats are going to challenge those results? Well, no, but I think here's the thing is that if Trump wins it outright, it's only going to be they haven't counted the uh, the mail in ballots yet. Oh, yeah. And so I think it's just like going to be a big fight. And, you, you know, you you had Hillary Clinton. Uh, sending that message publicly to Joe Biden, you know, don't accept the, you know, the Democrats are doing, they are gearing up. They, they know that they can't do what they did in 2000. Um, and 
and I don't think that they w- will. Um, but you know, the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court. I mean, who knows? I don't want to get into that too much. But what we're going to see, there's two sort of like tracks here. We're going to see, I think, increasing violence. Um, you know, not unlike what we've seen over the past couple of weeks. And I think we're going to see Donald Trump um, do two things. One, stuff like the CDC doing the eviction deferral, essentially, is what it really is, for four months, just past the election. Um, And I think we're going to see that. And I think that's going to be good, frankly. uh, Not necessarily good in terms of, of Trump losing the election, but good in terms of like, you know, I would like something more dramatic than a deferral of eviction. Like, how about no eviction? period. Or here's a bunch of money, renters, pay your landlords, that type of thing. Um, But, and I think we're going to see other measures like that. And then I think we're going to see he can get increasingly nutso in terms of trying to draw Joe Biden out because Joe Biden is basically in a, you know, like the, uh, what do they tell you to get like this when you get it? You know what? Like he's just basically rope a doping Joe Biden is. And here is Donald Trump just really casting around for some type of challenge that Joe Biden will step up to. Oh, sorry. This is uh, clip number eight. Biden, why why the drug test? What do you think he's on? I'll tell you. Well, he's on some kind of an enhancement, in my opinion. And I say we should both. I should take a drug test, so should he. Because we don't want to have a situation where a guy is taking some kind of a... It's like athletes, like a... No, no. He should take... I want to take one. I'll take one. He'll take one. We should both take a drug test. Wow. Good stuff. In moments, more from Laura's (laughs) newsmaking exclusive. (laughs) He's right about that. Good stuff. (laughs) I want to take a drug test. Uh, Where do you think he's going to get his pee for that? Hmm... Maybe Jared, Jared get Baron. in here. Jared. Yeah. Oh, Baron, right. He'll get Baron's pee. Here, test this one. Should be fine. Yeah. Should be fine. It better be we'll fine. Find, we'll find out what drugs Baron's on. Um, does anybody know if Adderall shows up in your in your pee? It doesn't? Okay. Yeah. Blood test. Or a t- t- drug well test. then mine is fine. <laughs> yeah, we're good. We're good. Probably couldn't be any of the older brothers. Oh no. Um, oh, I can't here, wait is, for that to happen. This is awesome. This is this is one of my favorites. Um, so Fox and Friends are trying to get to the bottom of what's going on with all this uh, coordination with um with protesters. You know, this whole thing where they're taking planes or they're driving cars to places or there's some type of Rico. We're gonna Rico this is a Rico thing because there's a lot of coordination with these anarchists. They have a whole hierarchy and regime of where they get orders and uh, they don't quite get the, uh, but here it is. Kilmeade's crack the code. Do you know how they're communicating uh, with each other, Jamie? I have no idea. Stop asking mm. me. <laughs> Why would I know about that? Here's Brian Kilmeade um, pointing out how they're communicating. I'm grateful that the Attorney General, William Barr, has made it official that they're doing investigations not only to who came in from out of town from Kenosha, but who's uh, fomenting the unrest daily, 80-plus days in uh, Portland. Same thing that happened in Seattle. The same thing that's taken place in so many other cities. It's an organized effort. You see these men and these women with earpieces. A lot of times they have weapons. They got bats. They got bricks. And he's trying to find out who's funding it. And what's going on here? Steve, I imagine you can easily do that by some of the hundreds that you've arrested. Somebody's got to speak and say, who's signing the checks yeah. that's paying for this? In- Your pieces. Now, Jamie, I know that you know nothing about this, but let's just break this down. Earpieces. I'm trying to think of like, what kind of earpieces would people maybe have that they're communicating with other people? Could they... Like if you're going out and you're part of a organized cabal or some type of like organized, I guess, militia, secret militia to overthrow uh, cities, 
do you go and wear special earpieces? Or maybe what you could do is use one of those like um, headphones that you use that are plugged into your phone so that you can call people or go on like a party app or something. Like or maybe some that, AirPods. Like, like, like what, what, what decade is Brian Kilmeade lo- living in that they need special earpieces to uh, contact people as opposed to like, no, hey man, I'm on Bluetooth. What's up? Wow. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just uh, talking on Bluetooth on my phone. No, no, I'm not part of a secret cabal. Uh, no, hey, where did I get this? Um, yeah, no, uh, Soros paid for it. I get, I'm the only person in the world who has uh, this Bluetooth connectivity on my phone. Well, when you're in a combat situation, right, and your anti fuck commander needs to give you some instructions, you don't always have time to pull out your phone, you know? Well, that's my um, point. That's why I use the Bluetooth, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have some breaking news. This is from the police department, the anti DHS department uh, I have. And this is looks to be what their communicators look like. Oh, so. my gosh. Oh, yeah. The turtle communication. And Do those come with headphones, though? Yes. Well, you can see they kind of have headphones on the side here. Wouldn't know. Wow. They're really... They're really hitting. Uh, they're really peaking over at Fox these days. <laughs> they're really peaking. This is unbelievable, though. Kilmeade is really on this kick. They're all just talking about how these people are. Look at uh, Brian Kilmeade. Oh, this is on tweet. Uh, did he tweet this? Or no? No, here it is. Here is uh, uh, Brian Kilmeade again. And then we'll do, well, <clears throat> let's start with Ducey. They really, they are con- trying to convince their Fox and friends, friends, that this is a, just a paid, this is a mercenary army, essentially, that's been unleashed on the streets of, of the United States. Uh, here it is, Steve Ducey, number 12. I think I was reading in the Daily Mail where there was a story about a guy who had been arrested in like three different places, uh, Kenosha and Washington and somebody else. And, uh, it, you know, it's one thing if you do the peaceful protesting. We understand that. But if there is coordination and if there is funding of uh, agitators to destroy businesses, that's why the AG is looking at that. Sounds like they're looking at RICO and all sorts of things, looking at the leadership, if there is a structure to it. The problem is... Uh, you know, with a lot of the dark money out there these days, mm. it's hard to figure out <laughs> exactly who is funding different things. Uh, it, it will be interesting. First of all, they're not OK with peaceful protests. I don't know if anybody remembers uh, Colin Kaepernick, uh, like the like the the, the uh, NBA. No, they the, loved the, it the when he did that. I thought, yeah, they were very supportive of that. We really appreciate him being peaceful about it. We, you peaceful is fine, but you cannot actually move your body in any fashion. And then this idea of like dark money, dark money is money that is given to uh, PACs that run political ads, but it's dark because of the nature of the pack. You are allowed to shield who's giving the money. If you're organizing some type of, um, a street project like you don't need to have dark money it's not like what i don't even understand what that means what does that mean dark money it's secret money oh secret money Hmm. you know every movement needs its angles there you go well it's not just a doocy it's his buddy brian kilmeade who is wants to know you know this is the way that they do this right it's dark money funding this it's almost like terrorist funding money like you need to send people out there and then kilmeade asked the obvious question like why aren't these people being chased down like al-qaeda Also, when you talk about what is really underlying all this unrest, yes, racial justice, understand it. We have a ways to go as a country. I understand we got to get on that path. Got it. But when the night falls, in comes these groups, many of which are Antifa. And I think the attorney general made a lot of Americans feel better yesterday when he revealed for sure that there's an investigation going in. Hundreds have been arrested about who this group is. And if we can unwind Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, 
Hezbollah. Why can't we unwind a domestic group, find out how they're funded, what pushes them, and out of the hundreds that are out there members, somebody will crack. But in Portland, it gets worse. Do you know that terrible mayor who's going to move because they keep protesting at his tower? The guy, that, the person that's running against him actually is an outward supporter of Antifa. I am Antifa, she says. I, uh, her name is Sarah I, I, I Neron. So this is unbelievable that a group that is causing so much unrest, damage, and in some cases death, right. is now embraced by a candidate running for mayor. Uh, and they, they, you know, uh, they're going to have to have a runoff because nobody got a majority in that particular race. With what is it? Where are the funds that they what, like? I'm curious as like what these you know. Not only, I, I, I'm quite convinced that there's no like billionaire or millionaire funding this, but like, what are what are the what are the expenses that these protesters have? Like, who's buying them their umbrellas? Like, how do these guys all have umbrellas? Or, yeah, I mean, you got your umbrellas, you got your giant bags of soup, you got your milkshakes. That could add up. But who? What about car? Where Where are they getting gas money? What, what billionaire is financing all this gas money where they're driving to places or that maybe they're taking a plane? We got to look into this. I mean, like, I, I would be curious. I mean, it would actually be helpful at this point uh, to, you know, be paying people to go out there and protest. I hope it would be a significant money. Uh, we could use that type of stimulus. Yeah. And the kind of organization they're ascribing to the radical left is actually something that uh, we could use a little more of. I was so say. it's nice. It's nice always to see that the rights um, aspirations for us are so are so broad, and I think we should strive to meet them. There you go. Well, I think it could be one of two things, right? Like every protest that Fox News has covered since the Tea Party has been paid for by you know special interests and the and the right. And they can't conceive of an organic movement of any kind. So that's, I, I think, yeah, yeah, no, I think this that's is absolutely correct. This is yeah. an extremely old trope saying that, oh, there's no way that uh, black people would possibly be uh, be unsatisfied with their circumstances and decide to rise up and do something about it on their own. You know, it must be these uh, white Marxists. Uh, usually the Jews is what they mean by that. Uh, getting them all getting them all riled up. This goes back to the time of slave uprisings. And there always have been uh, white leftists organizing in solidarity for to, black liberation. But that's uh, that's that's a little different to that point. I uh, did some research on Antifa uh, earpieces, and I think we have a culprit for who's funding this. It's a uh, Heim Saban. Mm. I'm blowing all the comms. All right. Last <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go back to the Antifa office and shred some docs after this. Last call of the day. Call him from a 570. Uh, you got to just do your question quick because I'm getting bumped off the, the phone. Hi, um, this is also Sam from uh, the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area, which is uh, Biden's hometown. All right, Sam um, from Wilkes-Barre, Biden. I just really wanted to say quick uh, that I'm disabled in a wheelchair and heavily immunosuppressed. I just wanted to give a different perspective really quick on um, what's going on with like the employment in our area and how that's affecting voters that's not talked about. Um, Wolf, Governor Wolf gave the mandate back in May, for, or Mar I'm sorry, early March, when pretty much everyone around here that I know lost their jobs, um, including my fiance. He then was brought back to work where he could work from home. And then his employer, against the current mandate, which says if you should could work from home, you need to work from home, brought them back into the office, no explanation, no email, no meeting. So now my fiance is also my caretaker. He is working in an office building. So it's very frustrating. His coworker called the governor's office. They said, call the state police because they're violating the mandate. The state police said, what do you want us to do about it? So there is no protections for workers. They know we live in a studio apartment, which also presents a whole bunch of problems 
if he gets sick and brings it home to me, like basically I'm dead, but it's, it's just, there's no protections. People here are out of jobs and it's pushing people to the right. People that I have known, I went up, grew, grew up in the hardcore scene with like music, food, not bombs and all of that. And what's happening now is they're all being pushed to the right. And this is people on Facebook that I see that I've known my entire life that are being pushed right from QAnon conspiracies. And they are displacing their anger at instead of the federal government, the messaging is working where they're frustrated at Wolf and they're going to vote Republican now. So it is just so incredibly frustrating and no one's talking about it. And one last thing, the DNC is not pushing the, like, messaging of the Supreme Court and the uh, circuit judges. That That is insane to me that that is such. Ugh. I, I lost you. Uh, sorry, you there? Yes. Okay, I uh, sorry, I lost you. Yeah, it's insane that no. they don't push the judges. They're not pushing really anything. Uh, it is really no. just this notion that Donald Trump is doing bad on coronavirus. But the thing is, is there's not a coordinated messaging. There, you know, there is the 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 problem is that you don't have these governors who are able to criticize Donald Trump because they, they have a transactional relationship with the federal government. They need stuff. They don't have right. it. And so they're afraid to criticize Donald Trump. So there's no message for Wolf to say like, look, we don't have the resources here. We don't. Um, and uh, I, 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 you know, that's where really, frankly, the Democrats should have should be back in Washington. They shouldn't have gone on break. They should be out there passing bills. I know six, you know, whatever what feels like about five months ago, they passed the Heroes Act, which nobody can even like sort of like, um, you know, has a has a message to that bill. It's for heroes. Does anybody else knows what's right. in the Heroes Act? I do. But I mean. What, on Facebook, there's not, you know, they, they need a, they need to come back and start passing, um, you know, something with three things in it for $3 trillion, state and local government support, you know, the help the families uh, bill or something like that, the HEROES Act. But, uh, but I, 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 go ahead. But I don't think that people like, the thing that's so frustrating is, is like, I'm still on Facebook, which I'd like in the, in the process of deleting, but these are all people that I know. So let's say I have like a thousand Facebook friends and the messaging that came out of the White House where they were pushing the blame onto the governors early is working. Because again, I'm talking about like the like kids that I grew up with, again, in the like punk scene that like worked for free Tibet back in the 90s. Yeah. I'm 40. So like the frustrating thing is these people are now so pissed off from not being able to work that they're all blaming, like, basically their governor. Because I have friends that live in, like, other Democratic right. states. And instead of, like, seeing the bigger picture, well, like, no, it's the federal government that's failing you. And it's, I mean, it's also sometimes the governors. But it's so frustrating to see these people being radicalized in well, the opposite direction. Yeah. And, Tell your Sam, friends to uh, listen to some crass records. Sam, appreciate, uh, right? <laughs> Sam, exactly. appreciate the call. Hang in there. Thank you. Thank Ooh, you. Which we had uh, something more to tell you. All right, folks, uh, that's it for calls. I'm going to read three IMs and get out of here. <clears throat> um, I read some of these already. Uh, Quinn from Indianapolis. I have a friend who works in a high school near Indianapolis with 3000 students. They've been back in session for a few weeks and have had seven COVID cases. I'm surprised it's not higher. Indiana has been for whatever reason, um, has been contained there. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I read the same thing. Uh, bear at home too. In my opinion, that was a great interview on many levels. Hopefully Sam sets up more conversations like that and less on the LARPers. 
Destiny's argument is based on morality. If the shooter had a reasonable view, he would be killed by the mob. Um, I guess if I put a gun, you know, like I, 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 I don't know what morality means in that respect. You, when you go down with a gun to a protest, uh, you are inviting violence. It is called just a reasonable person going to a gun to a protest must realize there is a significant chance that they would be using that gun. This is not a situation where he's in his, 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 you know, sh closing up the shop, yeah. you know, uh, after a hard day at work and all of a sudden like there's marauders coming in and he's afraid for his life and he runs into the back room and gets a gun to protect himself. Right. This is a guy going to look for trouble. There's also like reports of uh, from multiple case uh, sources, including the Daily Caller's video that's still up on the Daily Caller's YouTube page, of people saying he was brandishing his weapon in threatening ways, telling them to get out of their car and giving orders that he is not authorized to give. The kid was a prob the kid was a problem by but, multiple sources beyond but, just having the gun. But yeah, right. but even if, if I mean, particularly when you're talking more, more I'm mean, like even if none of that is the case, it's just like right. when you make a decision to bring a gun to yeah. a protest. You're responsible for what happens with that gun. Yeah. And, and even yes. if you take these uh, arguments at face value, right, like he's protecting private property, that's based on a bad morality that says violence towards property is worse than violence towards human beings. And, and, and I'm sorry, again, I don't I, like like I, the idea that he's protecting property. I want to know other circumstances where he's out there protecting property. Is he out there also fighting for contract rights and whatnot? No, the guy wanted an opportunity to go into a situation with a gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Max in the BK. Uh, fascinating uh, interview last Friday. I was reminded when your guest spoke about TV ads uh, affecting a white uh, perception on race about a YouTube video titled O and A race war, uh, Patrick O'Neill versus Nick DiPaolo from 2013. In the first 40 minutes of that video, Anthony Cumia and Nick DiPaolo filter the entirety of their grievance through the TV ads they were watching at the time and what races they felt the people should be. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. Amazing to construct a worldview that way. I think that's the way people do it. Um, all right, three more, sorry. PCT Joe. Uh, do you think the two parties moving to establishment Dems and progressive Dems would be ideal for the near future if it did happen? That's I, I would love the uh, the there to be a center right party and a left wing party. Yeah, and no right or wing. That'd be nice. Uh, party <laughs> yeah. and a left wing party. As the fascist administration yeah. is currently in office, yeah, I think that would be nice. Yeah, I'm not gonna hold my breath, unfortunately. Leffy Lib. Open the phones, you call me. Okay. Uh, John Wilkes Booth project. Elected Democrats like Pelosi and Mayor Kenny in Philadelphia flaunting COVID restrictions are hurting our ability to enforce restrictions to fight a second. I agree. Totally. And the final I am of the day. Militant apathy. Great job on Stuart Stevens. And I mean that. Now do Glenn Greenwald and Matt Taibbi, who both came on your show with the effery. Ooh. All right, folks. Um, uh, the crew will be here tomorrow, uh, running a, um, um, one more, Ma uh, Michael, uh, best of, and see you on Friday. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice was made